the April 25th, 2016 meeting of the Planning Board of the Town of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you all for showing up. It was great. Um, we have a fairly busy agenda tonight, <coughs> which I'll run through briefly. First item is approving minutes of the pre previous meeting. There is a consent agenda item in by the C500 building uh, replacement site plan requesting a one year extension of the um, site plan approval previously granted. And uh, two items of old business, Cape Chiropractic and Acupuncture, three lot minor subdivision, and two mixed use building site plan. Uh, following that will be the Verizon Wireless Water Tank Antennas site plan. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, item of new business, the 535 Shore Road site plan. Uh, seeking site plan review for a uh, space at 535 Shore Road. And finally, there will be an opportunity for public comment on anything which has not uh, been subject to public comment before. Uh, we'll proceed first to the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. The board has received copies. Are there any corrections, additions, what have you? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Joe, thank you. Motion, motion to approve the minutes. Second, Henry, thank you. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move next to the consent agenda, the um, in by the C500 building, um, excuse me, in by the C is requesting a one year extension of the site plan approved on June 16, 2015 for replacement of the 500 building located at 40 Bowery Beach Road. Uh, the planning board is authorized under section 19-9-4B4 of the zoning ordinance to grant one year, one, one year extension for site plan approvals. Uh, would the end like to be heard from? Yeah, I'll make it short and sweet. Eric Doobie from Casco Bay Engineering rep re representing uh, In by the Sea. Um, basically what happens is um, we have a short construction window and um, from October to May, based on um, uh, basically um, uh, the period of, um, of when we have uh, visitors. So we're requesting an extension. We didn't, we're looking at doing modular construction. So um, we're in line now um, to have that move forward. So we're looking forward to doing it this October. Any questions from the board? Applicant, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Jonathan, thank you. Second, um, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the request submitted and project previously approved, the planning board extends the quote 500 building site plan approval granted to the In by the Sea LLC and located at 40 Bowery Beach to June 16, 2007. Second, and we have a motion that has been seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, the uh, first, <coughs> excuse me, item of old business. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Two Penguin Properties LLC owned by Dr. Zev and Amber Meyerowitz are requesting minor subdivision review of a three lot subdivision, and site plan review of two buildings containing 6,205 square feet of medical office space, 10 multifamily residential units, and a 357 square foot building connector located at 12 Hill Way. <clears throat> the application will be reviewed for compliance with section 16-2-3, minor subdivision review, section 19-9, site plan review, and section 19-6-4, town center design standards. The procedure will be as follows. The board will have a summary of the applicant uh, of the changes made to the plans since the last meeting. We will then open the meeting for uh, a public hearing, which is scheduled for this evening on this application. At the close of the public hearing, the board will begin substantive discussion. And at the close of the discussion, the board 
can do one of several things. It can approve, approve of conditions, deny, or table the project to the next meeting. So proceeding on that schedule, uh, we would like to hear first from the applicant, uh, applicant's representatives. If you could all please uh, give your name and either address or if you're a representative, what your uh, professional capacity is. Good evening, uh, members of the planning board. Uh, my name is Dr. Zeb Meyerowitz. Five years ago, uh, my wife and I moved uh, to Cape Elizabeth to start a community-focused private practice that I am proud to say has grown in leaps and bounds beyond our wildest expectations. Uh, more importantly, uh, Cape Elizabeth has become our home and we are deeply entrenched in the community and would like to continue our personal and professional uh, relationship in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, we purchased the 12 Hill Way land parcel in the fall of 2014 and with our team at WBRC Engineers and Architects, we have created a subdivision and site plan that significantly enriches the town center while satisfying many of the stated goals of town center development. With that said, I would like to turn the microphone over to our experts. Uh, we have Rob Frank, Director of Civic and Commercial Studios, John Kenny, Civil Engineer, Will Pogar, Principal Architect, and Portland Regional Manager and Architect Jocelyn Booth. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Robert Frank. I'm a <clears throat> professional engineer with WBRC Architects Engineers, uh, Portland and Bangor. Um, we are going to just basically recap the uh, information provided to you last time, identifying any changes. Uh, I will go through uh, some real quick intro items, then I'll turn it over to John Kenny and Jocelyn, who will uh, fill in a little bit more of the detail. And then uh, we did come prepared with the uh, site plans that you were provided with. In fact, as we had done last time, here's a hard copy of this. Uh, no, thank you. Of the drive, so you can share that around. So uh, for folks that may not have been here last time, project site, uh, the project is uh, literally in the center of Cape Elizabeth, not only in the town center district, but as you can see from the perimeter of the town uh, in the geographic center of town. This is a zooming into the project site at 12 Hill Way. Uh, this is Hill Way over here, uh, Ocean House Road. Project continues to be a three lot land subdivision as presented at the last meeting, comprising of a 1.3 acre, 0.43, and a 0.29 acre parcel. There is no change to the building footprint from the last presentation. All buildings are uh, below the 5,000 square foot threshold. Um, the use of the building is mixed use, um, as is consistent with the purpose of the district, which is to encourage an identifiable town center that includes a village feeling, mixed retail and residential uses, uh, and an inviting or environmental environment inviting to pedestrians. Uh, the building footprint number one below uh, 5,000 square feet will comprise six uh, residential units, one of which is the owner's unit uh, on the upper levels and a lower level, which is a medical clinic, also an approved use. Uh, also operated by the applicant and the owners. There's a small connector between the two footprints and then building footprint two, also under 5,000 square feet, will house four uh, units on the upper level as well as medical clinic space below. That is not a change from the last meeting. Uh, I'll probably invite John up to um, talk about this maybe in more detail as we get into the grading. The, the most notable change, I think, after the site walk with you folks and after meeting with the tree warden, we did uh, slide the uh, sidewalk that was previously located up in this location further down to avoid some ledge outcrop and to work its way into the site in a more meaningful fashion. We also 
Actually, I'll leave it here. We also provided a curb along Hillway as part of the improvements that are occurring in Hillway. From a grading standpoint, uh, John will get into more detail later. I suspect as you talk about stormwater, we have uh, reworked this area to include the rain garden that we talked about with the uh, review of the town engineer. And we've also redone the grading over here to accommodate the relocated uh, sidewalk. As stated previously, all the areas in blue are uh, porous pavement. And again, the change on this plan, the notable change is the rain garden down here. From a utility standpoint, uh, we've identified the utilities serving the farmhouse. There really is no change uh, other than that on this plan. Orange representing sewer, blue representing water, and the purple representing power. Previously, we presented you uh, this uh, rendered site plan that showed uh, plantings out here after meeting on site, after looking at the existing vegetation in this location. We're actually, we've altered that to uh, really take into account uh, the existing vegetation here. We've altered the plantings here as discussed uh, with uh, the folks in planning and with the tree warden. And we've also modified this area. And in fact, as late as today, um, talking about this is uh, more of a, a front yard slash um, a yard uh, ornamental presentation versus a screen. So what currently is shown, we have some evergreens on this corner of the building to minimize the scale and the bulk here. We also have some additional plantings over in here that would sort of infill that area uh, that is flanked by either side by existing vegetation. Uh, these were prepared earlier today. Again, we were anticipating coming back uh, before you with a final planting plan after there's been some discussion. Uh, these are simply two options that show something that uh, organizes around some apple trees or more uh, fruit tree plantings and some ornamentals that would make this more of a feature and uh, uh, also minimizing some of the uh, screen, if you will, the planting here, making it more of a specimen planting. And these are really just two options that look at how that might change. So we will seek some guidance from you as you go through that portion of the review. Um, this uh, <clears throat> map, which was presented uh, previously, is really intended to show uh, the bulk and the, the scale and the size of the building footprint and how within other structures located within the town center that it is uh, neither the smallest nor the largest structure in the district. Um, I would invite, uh, John, anything we missed on the, I guess the, the layout plan we identified. I'll go back. Actually, I'll st stop right here. We did identify there's a one parking space here for the farmhouse, plus uh, they'll share three over here. That provides one uh, excess parking space on the uh, the entire development that's in addition uh, or more than required. Again, trying to meet the standard of minimizing excess pavement. We've kept it to <clears throat> the ordinance requirement and have used the uh, uh, one consolidated parking all using the porous pavement. So I guess I would invite uh, Jocelyn Booth, who's an architect with the firm, to describe the uh, building and how that works with the town center standards. Thanks. <laughs> Hi there. So my name is Jocelyn Booth. I'm an architect with WBRC Architects and Engineers. So we've designed these two buildings um, to each represent a traditional coastal home. In order to better show the design to you on these elevations that we're looking at, we've actually hidden all the trees and vegetation that would normally be in front of them that you saw on the planting diagrams earlier. We've worked closely with um, the design requirements to design a building which we believe will fit in with the surroundings and complies with all of the requirements given in the town center district. Um, so the design requirements clearly list guidelines for items such as minimum roof pitch, uh, maximum building height, exterior materials, just to list a few. Um, as you'll be able to see from this presentation as well as the full packet of submitted materials, uh, the design criteria have all been met. One item to note is that uh, due to the grading on this site, the building has been designed with two thirds of the project as a two story building and only one third of the building is actually designed as a three story building. 
um, and uses scale reducing elements, which we'll talk about on the next couple slides to bring that down um, and modulate the building height. Uh, so this is a view showing the approach on the site from Hillway from the town center. Again, the trees have been ghosted in to better show the building. The materials that we're using use the typical language of coastal New England uh, vernacular. We have a traditional, traditional New England shingle siding with five inch exposure and woven corners. The colors are in the neutral range in the gray to green family. We have a white trim and detailing. Uh, one of the changes since the last meeting is we've remo uh, removed the stone base that was a wainscoting as part of a um, cost reduction effort. Other architectural features that we have are um, an architectural grade roof. We have double hung windows with mullions, very traditional, and craftsman style columns and doors. Shown here is a view from Ocean House Road. Um, in order to fit in with the neighborhood, we've used a number of scale reducing techniques, such as gables and dormers, woven corner boards, accent trim, and articulation of building facades. We also have traditions, traditional scale reducing techniques of porches um, and decks, as well as the landscaping techniques talked about earlier with the plantings. Um, additionally, on Hillway, there's a berming that takes place on Hillway, creating an amphitheater down below so that the elevation is raised up along Hillway to again screen part of that three-story portion of the building. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm going to go back for one second. Um, also shown here is the, um, the walkway that we were talking about previously. Um, this is a garden pathway and the intent is to provide access from Ocean House Road to the site. Um, the idea is to have a decorative feature such as a fence and landscaping and some of the sketches that Rob showed a minute ago talking about the different options with that which are being worked through. This perspective is a view of the entry on Hillway as you approach the town center. Um, again, the trees have been ghosted in to show the, um, show the building better. There'll be an entry sign to the medical space as well as the planting and fencing in the background to screen the parking. Um, again, you can see here the architectural details of the porches, the double hung windows with mullions and the gables to bring down the scale. Excuse me, do you yes. have the amphitheater that you were just talking about? Is that it's hard to see from this view. It's basically, if you look at the grading plans, you can see that there's a, a portion of land right here that's raised up higher and there's actually a staircase going down that portion of land into the lower portion at the foot of the building. So this final rendering, which is coming in pretty darkly on that screen, I apologize, is um, the view without the trees ghosted in. So this is the view from Rand Road across the street with the trees that are intended in that space. Um, so as we hope you can see from this presentation, we've worked hard to design a building which is respectful to the town center and will fit into both its surrounding neighborhood and meet all the requirements. Are we, are that scene, uh, <coughs> this is from Rand Road, it's on Hillway. Um, Rand Road is a road that comes in perpendicular to Hillway, pretty close to the new entry into the medical space. And actually, I can go back to a site plan. I believe we should have one on there. Well, that's probably good right there. So it's standing from that road right there. Yes. The exterior material, mm -hmm. um, wood or composite? What, what will it be? We're looking at both. And it's going to be based on price. We'd like to be approved for both options. Um, and I have a sample here we can look at if need be. Okay, John? Uh, I have a couple more questions. What's the material of the deck? The deck? I think we're looking at a composite material for the deck and for durability. The railing? Hmm? The railing? The railing, uh, at the moment, it's a design detail we're going to get to more, but at the moment it's um, a wood-capped rail with um, cables. And the um, uh, architectural columns under that, are those like round tapered columns? They're square tapered craftsman style columns. Any other questions for the architect? Okay, we'll continue.
Good evening. I'm John Kenny, a civil engineer for the project. Um, I just had a, a couple quick comments. Um, we just um, we have a review letter from the town engineer. Um, we we agree with all the the minor comments that they provided, and we'll be addressing all of those in the final set of of, uh, of uh, drawings for the next um, for the next meeting. Um, one one drawing I did provide is showing a fire truck tra traversing the site. And I, I sent that um, last week, I believe. I believe you've received copies of that. So, um, so with that said, uh, do you have any uh, quick questions on the engineering, or we'll get into that, that later, I assume? We'll, we'll come back if, okay. if we need it. All right, thank you. Uh, the end of our brief uh, formal presentation. Again, we brought the full set of submittal documents as PDF to put on the wall to go through any uh, questions you may have as you go through the substantive review. And uh, again, if there, unless there are any other questions, we'll yield to the other uh, proponents and the opponents. <clears throat> if there are no more questions for the applicant staff, I think we'll. Uh, go next to the public hearing and perhaps call on you folks afterwards to do and as part of our discussion of the uh, the uh, substance okay the uh, <clears throat> the next uh, part of the meeting is a public hearing um, I'd like to just go over with you a couple of ground rules and make this thing go smoothly uh, we do have a three minute limit per speaker and we do ask you to observe it if you can make your points even quicker than that, that would be fine too. Uh, we'll have a timer running, and if I give you a signal like this, this means your three minutes are up. You don't have to stop in mid-sentence, but I would ask you to um, leave the point you're making and, and, and uh, call it a day. Also, to make this move more quickly, what I'd like to do is have a little bit of a line, a little bit of a queue, say four or five people who are next to speak, and a person at the podium. That way, as one person finishes, the next person can step right up and we'll, we'll hear from all of you much more quickly than we otherwise would. Um, this, this can be an extended part of this part of the hearing, and so we're, we're trying to make it go as smoothly as possible so we can move on to the other parts of this application. And we have a very busy agenda tonight, so I would ask for your uh, cooperation. When you come to the podium, please uh, give your name and your address clearly so our recording secretary can get that down for the record. And uh, we'll start the clock, and uh, we look forward to your comments. And uh, I'd also like to thank all the people who have sent in letters, which is a very effective way to get your ideas before the board, because we can read them once, twice, several times, whatever it takes to absorb your message. So if I could have the first um, six people who would like to be heard come forward, one to the podium and five in a, a line behind them, that would be terrific. There, there, there's no order prescribed. Uh, <laughs> just sort of keep a five-person uh, line up there if you don't mind. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Teresa Collins. My husband Chris and I live at 19 Phillip Road. And I can say we are bewildered, truly, and shocked by the scope of this project. Phillip Road, Rand Road, we have a very quiet neighborhood. We have children that come and walk from school, play in our streets. We're very concerned about the amount of traffic that is now going to come through our streets to get as a shortcut to Hill Way to get to the entrance there. Uh, we have, a, like I mentioned, a quiet neighborhood. And this is going to definitely change our way of life. And that does not seem fair. We have lived there for many, many years. Our neighbors on Hill Road, Randway, and Phillip Road that live closest to this project are no longer going to be looking at woods. They're going to be looking at traffic coming and going to this quote unquote successful business. And we did not know that the village, um, the town square, extended to this point and that it would have buildings this big and parking lots that would so change our way of life. I'd like that considered when you're voting to approve or not approve this project, because we are there too. Thank you, ma'am. 
Hi, good evening. Katie Fairbanks Cliff. I live at 82 Ocean House Road. Um, I know tonight there's going to be a lot of talk about the building and the trees and the entrance, but what I'd like to share with you tonight is the character of Dr. Zev and Amber Marowitz. I'm the office manager at Cape Chiropractic and Acupuncture. I have been there almost four years and I came on right after they opened. Dr. Zevany Amber chose Cape Elizabeth to start a business and down the road to start a family. From the very beginning, they threw themselves into not only being a part of this community, but to give back by volunteering and supporting this town. As an office in the last four years, we have sponsored the football team, basketball, baseball, lacrosse, sailing, and field hockey teams. Prior to graduation, Thanksgiving food basket drive, try for preservation, wet paint auction, Fort Williams garden party, cycle for a cure, Cape Elizabeth Turkey Trot, and we are a naming sponsor for the Cape 5 Challenge, where, as you all know, all the money raised for that goes equally divided to all three of our schools. In our We Love Teachers campaign, we make and deliver treats to each and every teacher, town hall worker, police, fire department, and community service. We have done this every year since we opened our doors. We were a lead sponsor in Fashion Forecast that raised over $14,000 for Preble Street in honoring a lifelong Cape Elizabeth resident who passed away from cancer two years ago. We are working on Cape Elizabeth Try for Kids, the first to be held in our town, about our town, and for our town. Both Dr. Zeb and Amber have volunteered countless hours to train and treat our local athletes and students. They made this town their home by being a part of it, by giving back, by going the extra mile, by always staying late and working hard. They are caring and compassionate caregivers, and we in this town are lucky to have a young couple like this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Pat Salvi Bothell. I live at 80, 90 Ocean House Road. I own quite a few of those. Um, 90 Ocean House Road. I'm the business manager for Bothell's Mechanical Repair. We also own Fox Run Farm. And it is in that context, I just want to remind some of you at the hoops that my family had to jump through to grow blueberries in this town. Because one a butter, and I know here there's other a butters, one a butter had bad feelings about having blueberries in their backyard. There is a process that we allow that you can completely control an abutter's property. And that process is to buy the property. If you do not own it, yes, you should have some say, but it should not be, <coughs> it should not be to the point that people can't do what they want to do with their own property. I think the Meyerwitz paid an awful lot of money for a farmhouse on some land. And when I spent the hour that I spent looking at the plans at the town hall, I was amazed at the care that they put into this. The number of trees that they're leaving on that property, property that I'm now hearing people want to protect when it is overgrown with bramble, it is a, a depository for trash from <coughs> Cumberland Farms. I mean, I walked through there. Uh, about a week ago and could have probably picked up an entire garbage bag full of trash, mostly just recently spread there from Cumberland Farms. So I think that this can be a big improvement. I know that change is scary. But I think that when somebody puts as much time and thought into something and trying to make it fit and to conform to all of the criteria that the town center has, that some weight has to be given to that. Um, I sent you all a letter today um, that also just kind of over, went over my, some of my concerns. I'm really struck with the fact that they're saving that farmhouse. They could have just leveled that and made a bigger property. That farmhouse has been there for a really long time and it's going to make the approach down um, Scott Dyer look the same. I mean, it's going to be there. Um, I, I'm happy with how many trees they're leaving and how many trees they're adding and that the two structures that they're proposing are completely fitting. They're in the same scale as the existing farmhouse. The existing farmhouse is 3,340 square feet. So what they're proposing is, is very, very similar. Um, and I also think that a medical facility 
is going to create far less traffic than if they put in a restaurant or a store, which would also be okay in the town center design. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker, please. Stephen Bothell, um, owner of Bothell's Mechanical, and um, live at 90 Ocean House Road. Um, I feel that the project at Zevin Amber will be, will be a positive addition to the town. It will provide additional rental property, which is needed, and an improved office for Cape Chiropractic. Um, I took time to go to the town office and carefully examine the plans and plantings and entrances um, and exits for this project, and Hillway is the safest side to enter and exit. Uh, the buildings do not look commercial or boxy, but have a very residential pitched roofs and look. Trees and shrub plantings will actually make the area look much better than they do now, as the area is full of brush and trees that have fallen down. Um, the project shows extensive plantings that will improve the look of the, that area of town. Um, as it has been said, Zev and Amber will be living in one of the units, so they will be more in control of the renters of the other units. Um, knowing this, knowing about his business and having rent as myself, the traffic will not be, really be a big issue. Most of the time, people that live in rental units come and go maybe two or three times a day during the weekdays, going to work and coming home. So the renters will not have a very big impact um, as far as their business. I can't picture that being that many extra cars running up and down Hill Way. Um, one of the concerns someone had was um, lighting. Um, my feeling is that knowing Zev and Amber, um, they'll be good neighbors to the people on, in the Hillway area and be willing to work with them as far as lighting and any other concerns they might have. Um, I've seen a lot of change in my years here. Um, when my parents built their house in 1950, the population in this town was around 3,800 people. Um, when my great-grandparents moved here, they were around 1,500 people. Um, it's almost 10,000 now. I mean, there is going to be change. It can't be avoided. Um, we have nursing homes that we didn't have when I first started, when I first grew up here. We have dental offices, supermarkets, drugstores, and those all make this town more desirable to the people that come to live here. Um, also, in the 70s, we've lost three fuel stations and automotive repair shops in the central town period. So, I mean, there is going to be change. Um, in the 70s, there were zero condominiums. Now there's probably close to 10. Um, I don't see this as a negative impact to this town. It looks from the, the pictures and everything that they've got, um, it's very carefully thought out. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Steve Bates. I'm a Cape native, and for the last 18 years, I've lived at 4 Rand Road. I have seen a lot of changes over the years in the town, some good, some not. My comments here tonight, uh, unfortunately, are in the not category, as specifically relates to the proposed development at 12 Hill Way. Here are some things that are wrong with the proposal. No development, let me repeat, no development, however otherwise conforming and legal, should be allowed to overwhelm a long-standing abutting residential neighborhood, which incidentally, <clears throat> pre-existed the Hill property being in the town center zone. So again, this small neighborhood pre-existed Hillway being eligible for this development. This isn't an issue of resistance to change, but rather resistance to inappropriateness of dropping a monolithic building or two in too small an area with inability to totally buffer its negative effects from peaceful homeowners. Development approval should proceed only when applicant interests are in balance with neighboring and greater town interests, which currently they are not. 
the entire orientation of the project, oversized in height and sprawl, multi-use purpose, and traffic implications of this development are out of sync with well-documented town sentiment. A smaller scale footprint in height should face Route 77 with entrance and egress there. It should be coordinated with the development of the former Cumberland Farms property, whose new owner, I understand, is evidently amenable to uh, discussing options. The Hillway development proposal should be tabled until a new comprehensive plan is in place, or at the very minimum, until a new townwide survey of, uh, on town center preferences uh, is conducted. Uh, I had a question for the engineers. I had a concern when I hear rain garden and I think of mosquitoes. Uh, my other comment. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Debbie Andrews and I also live at Floor Rand Road. That was my husband who um, was just speaking. And we don't always agree, but on this matter we do. Um, first off, I just want to um, appreciate the testimony on the character of Amber and Zeph. That's really lovely. But I can give testimony for my neighbors. We're wonderful people, probably most people in the town are. And my own family have devoted hours to uh, nonprofit organizations and given many dollars as well. Moving on. Ideally, the property should remain wooded or a park, complementing the rhododendrons and the welcome to Cape Elizabeth sign, setting the stage for entering a semi-rural community. Two, the building footprint and number of stories is too massive and overwhelming to a residential neighborhood, at least this residential neighborhood. I haven't done the math, but it's, the pictures look like it's two to three size, two to three times the size of the houses in the immediate area. It's just overwhelming. Suggestion, orient the narrow sides of the building to the street to reduce the visual impact on the neighborhood. For example, the library is a relatively large building, but looks smaller in scale because the smaller width of the building faces the street. And finally, the road access should be on Route 77, not Hillway, which is already a speedway and can be difficult to um, leave Rand Road anyway. Route 77 already has commercial enterprises with cars currently entering and exiting, and it makes sense to continue that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Paul Seidman, 21 Oakview Drive. Uh, Peter, quick question, 5,000 square foot footprint, 20,000 square feet. I believe that exceeds the maximum in terms of the footprint. While Tarbox Triangle is technically part of the town center zone, the parcel Zevin Amber own is the definition of our rural character. This plan replaces that with what surveys tell us 10% or less wants or needs, unaffordable apartments. And, as if that weren't enough, we all know that this is the only property in town with our primary welcome home sign. It and the land behind it are the symbol and reality of what we love. So there's the insult on top of the injury. Exactly one year ago, a Rhode Island developer was planning to construct a giant mixed-use multiplex, including $700,000 condos between Selton here, on top of Woodland and Wetland. A friend and I met with him and asked him what he'd been told about potential obstacles and ob objections. He informed us that Maureen was only encouraging about his plan. He said she gave him zero indication of this being a very unpopular and unprofitable idea. He went on to do his own research and found that we were right. There's no market here for what he wanted to create. He ditched the plan and withdrew his bid. The Meyerowitzes told the Press Herald a month ago, we've basically designed the buildings that the town center planners wanted. I know that's quite accurate. Here's the tragic translation. It is what 90% of townspeople strongly do not want. 
The only reason they didn't know is the exact same reason Rhode Island, the Rhode Island developer didn't know. Because what you get from the town planner when a major development project comes to town is gross encouragement along the lines of, this is just what the town needs. If you want to be a valued and welcome part of this community, there is a simple way to do so. Don't bypass the people of the neighborhood when designing your plans. Planning without the people on board is not an act of affiliation, it's an act of aggression. I can tell you how sorry I, I can't tell you how sorry I am that Amber and Zeb didn't hear all of this before making a financial commitment. Let's instead work together to welcome an office plan appropriately located on already developed ground, one that isn't obscene in scale and location. Scaling back and relocating, Zeb and Amber will save hundreds of thousands in construction costs. Let's make this <laughs> a good fit for all concerned because sentiments here run deep. Names run deep too in this 250-year-old town. Jordan, Sprague, Fowler, Dyer, and Hill among them. But their presently controversial name and what they are known for doing in this town doesn't have to be permanently tarnished. Amber and Zev, anyone who has known Cape for 10 or 30 or 50 years, like so many of us here, knows tonight isn't about rules and rights. It's about protecting Cape's heart and soul, our unique history of top priority preservation of rural character. What the de devoted citizens of Cape most value is summed up in two words, land and trust. You hold both in your hands as you decide whether a neighborhood and town gateway remains as it is, small scale and wooded for generations to come. You will decide if the long-term residents' wishes and needs Seidman, are not, I'm just finishing my sentence as you welcomed me to do. Let's make it a very short sentence. I, I certainly will. You will decide if the long-term residents' wishes and needs are not being heard, just heard here tonight, but honored by your actions from this day forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Folks, we have a long way to go tonight, and I'd really like you to keep your expressions of approval or disapproval down, please. Thank you, ma'am. Hello. My name is Jana Frank, and my husband, Dean, and I live at 18 Rand Road. Our major concerns are that the size and scale of this project have not been thoroughly appreciated and reviewed by the town council and the impact this will have as we drive into our town center. The current green space with the beautiful tall trees welcomes all of us and what, what we love about Cape Elizabeth, a quaint village feel. Three-story, 10,000-plus square footage buildings, larger than the library and town hall buildings, with massive parking for multiple apartments and a commercial business doesn't make sense for this part of town and our neighborhood. And this is only phase one of this project. The owners want to continue development towards Scott Dyer in phase two, which has not even been talked about here. I agree with Suzanne McGinn that a statistically valid survey be completed to learn more about the opinions of Cape residents before embarking on a project of this scale. I would love to see this land purchased as continued green space, marking it as the entrance to our town as it serves currently. I am fearful if this project is approved, it will negatively impact our town in many ways, including a significant increase in traffic and bottlenecking onto each end of Hillway, a major area where school children are and walk. It will also seriously impact the property owners on Hillway and our neighborhood where the current proposal is to have the entrance and exits occur onto Hillway. The traffic and <coughs> lighting will significantly impact this small road and the negative impact on property values are enormous. Ten apartments with one to two cars each along with a chiropractic business and the amount of parking pavement and lighting that will be necessary will certainly change the whole character of our neighborhood and town. I sincerely hope the town will put this project on hold to seriously consider what we would truly like to see for our town center, not massive building and apartments, but a small scale <coughs> village. Thank you. Thank you. Could you save it in here? I want to get through the public. My name is Erin Muse, and I live at Five Hill Way, directly across from the said development. 
Um, I've lived on Rand Road for about 29 years of my life, and I've lived on Hillway for about three years now. I'm very glad that my neighbors have shown up to help with this situation, and I just want everyone to know that I'm right there with them, that I don't agree with this, and I feel like it's going to ruin the town that the people here love so much. The people in my generation are very against this. Um, we just want you to know that to some people this is just a road, but to us it's our home and that this will just absolutely devastate the people and the family in my neighborhood that I've grown to love so much, and that I really wish that you would reconsider what you're doing to the citizens of this town. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Stan Smoody Roberts. Um, I'm a former uh, tenant of Zev and Amber. I lived in the 12 uh, Hillway uh, farmhouse from uh, from June to this past February. Um, I, I think it's fantastic that we have here a development proposal from local uh, wonderful people such as Evan Amber um, and not some uh, LLC or some development company from out of state. Um, Zev and Amber have been uh, really wonderful uh, landlords. Um, I, I grew up here in Cape Elizabeth uh, and it was so nice to have an opportunity to be able to come back to this town uh, and to rent a place that was affordable. Um, they've taken wonderful care of us, uh, plowing, uh, landscaping. Um, for example, we had early on some issues with the hot water, and not only did they replace the hot water heater with, um, with a, new, a new unit, but they replaced it with a, uh, a heat pump electric hot water heater that also reduced our utility costs quite a bit. I think that just goes to show um, how much they care about who's renting from them. Uh, additionally, um, having grown up here, uh, I do think that having a vibrant downtown is very important for Cape Elizabeth. We don't want to just be a, a bedroom suburban community. Um, I, think, I do think it's important to, uh, to protect our rural uh, and our, our farmland and our rural areas. But like what was earlier mentioned by uh, someone um, before, that forest is pretty trashed out. It's not, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not a woods that's really something that, uh, that is worth, um, well, not worth, but it's not something that is to be uh, <laughs> protected, I guess. It's, it's, it's a place that I think is, is really, would be a, a wonderful area to have to add to the downtown. Um, and I, I do think that Seven and Amber um, are extremely uh, conscientious about wanting to build and develop a, um, a building that is in keeping with the town and in keeping with the neighbors. And I, I, uh, I, I just want to um, say that I, I think it's excellent that we have local people here to develop and not someone from out of town. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Emery. I live at uh, 12 Juniper Lane in the uh, Brentwood neighborhood. I wrote a letter to the planning board, and it has several attachments at the end, which are Google Earth images going up Hillway and other images of the town center. Uh, I came to town hall uh, to take a look quickly at the application and I looked at the site plan and immediately after having read the article, I haven't followed uh, the design process, but having read the article in the Portland Press Herald, my worst fears were realized at that point that the, in the development, because of whatever issues, is oriented uh, to uh, Hill Way rather than Route 77. Uh, I don't think that someone's business, their reputation in town, any of those issues should come to bear in, in terms of the d discussion. I think people that own property uh, who are doing a permitted use have standing and should be certainly given the benefit of the doubt. That said, we have a site plan review process and it affords the planning board an opportunity to look at the unique aspects of, of a project, even though it complies in all ways with the town center guidelines, um, it doesn't necessarily meet one of the most important ones. And what's lacking in the information that I've seen in the presentation is I don't see any renderings of the houses across the street. I don't see a cross section of Hillway. Uh, and I think that interface between this development and Hillway is unique. Um, 
my sense was if, if uh, nobody put the name of a street on the site plan, I would assume that Hill Way was Route 77 and vice versa. Similarly, when I look at the east elevation, that's the elevation I would expect to be facing Hill Way. It's two stories, it's, it's mitigated in its mass, and I hope the planning board doesn't spend a lot of time talking about materials because the issue here is massing in urban design type context. It's a bigger scale than whether or not we have uh, uh, what type of boards on the deck and so forth. That said, I made several suggestions to the planning board. One, I'd like to see, to see it flipped. I'm not anti-development. I'm in this business. I make a living in this business. So, and, uh, but on the other hand, I think that three-story facade facing Hillway is brutal. It really is. Uh, it could be um, mitigated. It, they could use the same devices they've used on the north elevation. They could pull the eave line down, use some more dormers, break up the expansiveness of the deck. And I have some concerns as to what trees are actually going to be remain. And I, and I say that not that I don't think your intent is to save them. It's that through the construction process and blasting, some may be disrupted. Uh, so I hope that there's plenty of uh, a close look at, at the topography and uh, what trees will remain. Uh, it was said that we're, we're at the center of the town center. That's not really the case. We're at the northerly edge of the town center. And that makes this juxtaposition or relationship to the Hillway neighborhood much more important. This could be beside Town Hall and is more appropriate in scale to Town Hall. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Folks, I ask once, Olatsky, and please, can you hold your uh, expressions of approval? Yes, sir, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Budin, and I live at 2 Davis Point Lane. And I'm here tonight to voice my support for the Hillway project. Um, I'd like to respectfully disagree with some of the prior comments that I've specifically addressed tonight. Um, I think it's of the utmost importance to have people, entrepreneurs, business people, people you live next to that have high morals, that are respectable people. Um, having said that, I first met Amber and Zev when they moved in across the hall. Um, from du to Davis Point Lane where I live now with my family, my wife, my two young daughters. Um, from the time I met them to this current day, they've been respectful neighbors, close family friends, and in regards why we're here tonight, extremely dedicated, successful, and ethical business professionals. Putting our personal acquaintance aside though, I would put my word, my character, and my professional reputation on the line to say that Amber and Zev are some of the hardest working, knowledgeable, and respectable business owners slash operators I've ever met. Um, and to respectfully disagree with another comment that was made tonight about the traffic, um, like I said, I live directly above their business currently. When I first moved there, their business was non-existent. It was vacant beneath us. They moved in, and from the time that they started the build out, to today where they have a very successful growing business, I have not had one hindrance, one hassle, one threat, one problem with traffic. I let my two young daughters, seven years old and eight years out, outside in the yard to play at their freedom, ride bikes, play in the yard, whatever they want to do. And I don't have any worry that Amber and Zev are going to be disrespectful or any of their clients or the supposed traffic are going to injure them or put them in harm's way. Um, I'd also like to take a step back and think about this from uh, a business transaction. Right now, the state of Maine is, has two, two initiatives that have come up in recent, um, one in the Portland Press Herald, one in the Maine Center for Entrepreneurial uh, Development publication. Uh, one is the Educational Opportunity Tax Credit. The state of Maine is offering tax credits to people that come it to, back to work in Maine that are to help repay their student loans. The reason for that is because main businesses in this region and in the, in the community, we are facing um, difficulties finding skilled workers to do great jobs. Amber and Zev have grown this business organically. They moved to Cape Elizabeth, they started it, they funded it, and they've successfully grown it to where they need more space, more room. We should commend that in, in the state of Maine's current economy. We need growth. We need businesses like this that can operate like that. The second uh, initiative that's going on at USM, uh, the Maine Center for Graduate Professionals, 
they're also doing a similar thing. Um, please take these into consideration for the state of Maine economy and for Amber and Zev. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. <clears throat> Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Friedman. I live at 31 Brentwood Road. And while not here to talk about the particulars of this development, and I know there are some concerns, I am speaking in favor of the development as someone who does support a vibrant downtown, village center, town center, whatever you want to call it. We've always been a couple clicks away from having something other than a bunch of vacant lots. And I think this is a start. You can't always start where you want to start. You start where someone wants to be the entrepreneur. Uh, village centers are important for both young people and old people. There's a trend to want to walk to businesses. Unfortunately, we've had some nice businesses start up and remain in town, and I think that needs to be supported. Unlike Scarborough, which will never have a downtown village because it's on Route 1 and there's been you know, a lot of negative about doing anything, within the town we have an opportunity to have a very rural town and yet a vibrant downtown, which I think is uh, desirable both for uh, now and the future. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. Hi, my name is Todd Larley. I live at uh, Five Cedar Ledge Road with my wife, Heather. Um, first, thank you to the Town Planning Board for providing us uh, this opportunity to speak on the Meyerowitz's behalf. It is, uh, it is our pleasure to be here. Um, Second, Zev and Amber have meticulously planned to expand their business off the lot in Hillway. When first moving here in 2012, both of them worked very hard to get their business off the ground in Cape Elizabeth. Through that hard work, the two of them have come to the point where they would like to expand their business to better serve the needs of their patients and the community. By following the codes and regulations set by the town of Cape, they are proposing a new structure, new structure in the town center. I've read, a lot, I've read a lot of articles that have been quoting plans or surveys that are out of context or stating that the Meyerowitzes are not listening to public opinion. I recently read the most recent Town Center Plan Committee findings that were unanimously passed in October of 2014, and I would like to state how this building clearly satisfies multiple criteria of the Town Center Plan. There are three stated goals. Number one, establish a primary commercial area support the town center as the primary location for new commercial development in Cape Elizabeth, and encourage a modest amount of small-scale mixed-use development. I see this proposal as specifically satisfying that stated goal. Visual appeal is number two. Improve the appearance and identity of the town center through continued application of the town center design standards to new development and formalizing the design standards for infrastructure improvement. This proposed development is beautiful and really conveys a well-built, mixed-use building while retaining the characteristics of a coastal home. Number three is infrastructure financing. Um, further investigate and, if appropriate, implement alternative financing tools to fund town center infrastructure improvements in a manner that moderates fiscal impacts on other town priorities. Since the town, st since the town center was established as a tax increment financing district, the tax dollars from this development will go directly back into Cape Elizabeth and infrastructure developments for the life of the building. The Meyerowitzes have clearly followed the town center findings to the letter. The building com completely complies with all zoning restrictions and regulations. The building proposal follows proper policy and procedure and should be permitted for construction. I look forward to seeing this building spearhead the remaining development in our community. Last and most important, Let's get to the crux of this development proposal. Who are Zev and Amber as people? We believe that Zev and Amber will take care of the development, the environment, and the community around them to the best of their ability, both as business partners and as husband and wife that live in the development and Cape community. They recognize the importance of Cape values as their own community, academics, passion, and ethics. Zev and Amber have made Cape their home in many ways. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good evening. Um, I'm here to support the project at 12 Hill Way. My name is Leslie Young. I also speak to my husband, Steve Young. We live at 8 Golden Ridge Lane. The property in question is in the town center zone, not a rural area. It is within the rights of the owner to build a building of this magnitude within the town plan and zoning laws. This has been zoned commercial since 1995. The public should be aware the area in question falls within the town's focus plan. 
The town center committee reviewed the standard plan just a year and a half ago, 2014, and they reapproved the plan, and it was even approved and appointed by our very own town council. With the approval of the town center standard plan from the town council came seven recommendations. Number five states to maintain the current zoning, which had thumbs up across the board. I have heard rumors that the owners of 12 Hill Way and the new owners of the old Cumberland Farms chose not to speak to each other to discuss options to work together. This rumor is false. Both parties did speak with each other and gave each other full support to do their own projects. I would like to remind the public that this is their right as the owners of this property. The property in question this evening is not for the rest of this town to decide how this property should or shouldn't be developed. I would like to remind people of this community, it is not our property to decide. We do not own it, the Myrits do. They are free to do as they wish, as long as their plans fall within our town center plan and zoning. I assure the public that their building plan most certainly does. According to town center zoning, they were capable of building 18 units, but they chose to keep it at 10. Others have talked about this piece of property being a green space, which just makes me somewhat laugh. I would have thought that the town a year and a half ago would have created more controversy about the land behind my house that runs along the Great Pond Green Belt Trail. This land was approved by this very board for the development of three house lots. There will be many oak trees cut down for this project and some of the beauty of the Green Belt Trail will be taken away. Not a word from the public on this and nor my husband and I, for we do not own the land. If we wanted to keep the land as it is behind our house, then we should have purchased the land when it became for sale. The same applies at 12 Hill Way. If people in this community felt this land in the town center should have remained as it is, they should have purchased it themselves. I would also like to point out that there has been talk that this building is a big, is a big project for the town center. This is a big project, but it is not the biggest building in our town center. Some people would like the board to think it is. It's bigger than the library, yes, but not bigger than the schools or the plaza that run in close proximity to this project. Let's not forget the Inn by the Sea is bigger than all of these buildings but put together, which blocks a beautiful water view. No concerns when they renovated and expanded this years ago. 12, 12 Hill Way is a large plot of land in the town center. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Brian Cliff. I live at 82 Ocean House Road. I uh, have been a resident of Cape Elizabeth for the past 24 years, and uh, I promise to be brief. Um, I'm not here to really debate the merits of the project as much as I am to speak on Seven Amber's character uh, and my support for their project based on the dedication that they have shown to our community uh, after having chosen to move here and establish their business. They are smart. They are compassionate. They have dedicated much time to our school system and our athletic teams volunteering and, and helping in, in that regard. Uh, and I believe very strongly that these are exactly the type of young people that we should be nurturing and helping to build the future of our town. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Christopher Newell. And with my wife, Christine, we live at Nine Rand Road. And probably from the letters I've seen, we're the newest neighbors in that area. Uh, however, we've been 30-year residents of the town of Cape Elizabeth. This project is going to challenge my libertarian uh, foundation because this is their property. They get to do what they want, with, as long as it's within the rules. However, we've heard a lot about the, the good nature of these people. I have no doubt about it. And I'm going to challenge them to be good neighbors because my concerns are, are simply summed up in the word pollution. First, visual pollution. All of these porches that are facing Rand Road, we all know what porches collect. I know they plan to live there. I know they plan to ask their neighbors to be good, or their, their tenants to be good neighbors. But what we can't have is the visual pollution of people storing things out on their porches because it's inconvenient to put it in their apartment. Noise pollution. Has any of you been up at 5 a.m. outside of sea salt when the trash trucks come and pick up the dumpster? Dumpster drivers don't care how much noise they make at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm out there. I run with a group of people. You don't believe me any Friday morning when the dumpster truck comes by. 
They'll make a lot of noise, and from what I see, there's a dumpster on this property, and that needs to be addressed. Light pollution. There is a street light, a lonely street light, on Hill Way. We're now going to have parking lot lights. We're going to have apartment lights. There's going to be a lot more light pollution invading our property than we've had before. I wish that to be addressed. And lastly, 54% of this admittedly ugly lot is about to be paved over and built upon. I have a hard time considering that to be a friendly use of the property. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Becky Fernald. I live on 313 Mitchell Road and uh, lived in Cape Elizabeth for um, 24 years. Um, I don't live in the area surrounding this project. However, I'm, I'm very concerned about um, the buildings that are built in our town center as part of a whole comprehensive plan. I think that the, um, the definitely the views uh, and, and the, of the neighborhood, the surrounding neighborhood, need to be strongly considered. It's only fair to those people who reside in the neighborhood um, that there is definitely very specific consideration given to their needs. Um, as you've heard some of the people say tonight, um, the, this um, was a residential area and it was, the area was changed to uh, the village center concept um, uh, after many of them had moved there. So I think it's important in planning this process to give very strong consideration to the, the neighborhood. I, um, I, this is um, nothing against the, um, the couple who have this business. It sounds like they make wonderful contributions to the community, and I applaud that. And I'm not against having any building there or a business there. I just think from the scale and the size of it um, seems out of place for that particular parcel of land. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the neighborhood that will be abutting. Um, I just have three things that I wanted to mention, but first just to say this is absolutely nothing to do with feelings about Zev or Amber. I think that they're a wonderful addition to our community and I absolutely would encourage them in their business and in the growth of their business. Um, two points, one would be the access coming on off of Hill Way. I, I do feel that that is, um, is problematic for traffic flow. Having lived in that neighborhood for 16 years now, um, that road is already a very um, active and often fast thoroughfare. There's often not much police um, monitoring of speeds on that road. My children uh, have been walking to school. I have a junior in high school now. They've been walking to school all these years. They do not walk on Hillway. They have never walked on Hillway because we don't have a good sidewalk on Hillway. We don't have a safe spot for them to really be walking to school on Hillway, and yet that is where we have our official crosswalk. Um, they cross at the unofficial crosswalk, which is almost always guarded by someone, but I do have concerns regarding flow of traffic, regarding of safety of children. Our neighborhood will always have children in it. It comes in at a price point where people can afford to get into Cape Elizabeth when they're young and they have young children. So I do think this impacts our neighborhood um, in that regard with traffic as well. Um, the only thing that I have specifically related to the project um, would be the scale. I do feel that the scale um, looking onto uh, that neighborhood, particularly off of Rand Road, but also off of Phillip, is very large, and I would prefer to see it oriented towards um, 77. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, <clears throat> my name is John Voltz. I'm a resident of 33 Phillip Road. Uh, I'd like to um, address, first of all, this is a really important site. This position right behind the uh, welcome sign to Cape Elizabeth is one of the most visible parcels in the entire town center. You can see it for half a mile down uh, Ocean House Road. So it's very important that we get this right. Um, this development is going to set the tone for future development along Route 77. Unfortunately, I feel the design, site design approach is flawed. It says the proposed project is designed to preserve the existing underdeveloped woodlands as much as possible. Yet despite its stated goal, it preserves only a small fraction of those woodlands. I, I estimate approximately 80% of it will be cleared or built on. But more importantly, 
the design is inconsistent with creating a visually appealing uh, and vibrant town center because the commercial street, which is in the town center plan, Route 77 is designed to become the new main street, the, the main street of Cape Elizabeth. This has 160 feet facing Ocean House Road, and it's going to be vacant except for a walkway. This is, you know, this is a mixed-use commercial building. You have one street that is all commercial, and you have one street that is commercial and residential, and all of the impact is funneled onto the one that's part residential. It makes no sense to me. You're not, you don't have the visual appeal of a town center where the buildings face the commercial sign and there's an entrance and you can know where you enter. It doesn't make any sense. Instead, what you've got is an overly large project that tries to hide behind what little trees remain and bury half of it underground. So when you look at the size of the building, it, um, I have, uh, you know, everywhere you look, the, the size sort of uh, may comply with the letter of the law, but undermines the spirit of the law. Every single elevation you look at it, that building appears as one building. So it has two buildings with a footprint, and the connecting lot, which is allowed for connecting walkways, it's not really a connecting walkway, it's a story and a half high, and it's about seven feet wide. And if you look at it, it looks like one building from virtually every elevation. So that intent of those regulations was to, create, was to limit the mass, but that's not, you know, while they're complying, they're, it doesn't, it doesn't actually meet the intent of the regulation. So I also have some subdivision comments, though, so that um, I feel like um, the easement that is left on, on lot two makes lot two, for any future user, really difficult to develop it, and it, and it impairs future development for the town center of lot two. And similarly, the, the positioning of lot one also may impair the development of lot two. Um, Finally, I would like to, to, to mention some flaws in the, uh, in, the, in the actual plan that was submitted that I found somewhat troubling. The traffic study does not appear to be valid. It was done, in, from what I saw, it was done in midwinter and then grossed up to estimate summer. That, the assumption that, you know, that, that assumption seems false. So, so Thank you, sir. Uh, your, your time is up. <clears throat> Thank you for it, your comments. It's very difficult to contain your comments to a 139 page report in three minutes. Thank you. I understand. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Amber Hayes. I live at 136 Two Lights Road. I've lived in Cape Elizabeth my entire life. Well, I've traveled around a lot. I have been in school with both Zev and Amber. They're lovely people. Their character is not in question here. They're great business people. I am thrilled that their business is thriving in this town. It's wonderful. We deserve that. But the character of Cape Elizabeth is because of our quiet town. We are not spillover from Portland. We are our own entity. And the importance of growing up a block away from Hillway, walking to school every day, playing in those woods my entire life, is why I moved my son and I back here. We own a house in Falmouth. I don't want to live in Falmouth. I don't want Route 1 Falmouth to become my hometown. Cape Elizabeth is so important to what we have in this environment. I don't think we sustain one apartment building, two apartment buildings, and how many more places are for sale that are going to be developed in this way. I live out on the peninsula. So my commute to work in Portland, which I know a lot of other people living in Broad Cove, that huge neighborhood, I'm going to go Spurwink because this will inevitably lead to a traffic light in an already overcrowded intersection. Traffic should stay with traffic. There is no excuse for the entrance and exit for this building to be on Hillway. It should stay on 77. I will redirect myself, and I'm sure other people will, to Spurwink. And I'm wondering if the traffic design has looked at that, because Spurwink is not capable of any more traffic than is already on there. I implore you, Amber and Zev, to please scale this back. I think it's great. It'll be a great addition for Cape Elizabeth. It's just too big. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> we, uh, I will now uh, close the public uh, portion of the hearing. Thank you all very much for showing up and expressing your views. 
Um, we'll now turn to the substantive discussion of the application. Um, we can do this a number of ways. First of all, I think maybe give the board a chance to, oh, I'm sorry, Henry? If you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I'd like one comment. Whilst I'm obviously listened to all of your comments, except one particular speaker, who somehow or other cast aspersions about the professionalism of one of the staff members on the, the, in this board, and I thought it was an extremely bad taste, and I think the gentleman ought to apologize. Personal attacks are not the subject of this, but yet, I have heard from that gentleman once or twice, and he always tries to go for personal attacks. I think it's wrong, and it should have held it back. And I'm also appalled that people had some desire to applaud that type of talk. I think this is not the time, nor the place, to bring that type of thing in. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Thank you, Henry. Um, OK, moving forward. Um, First of all, do the board members have any questions from the applicants' uh, professional advisors? Victoria. I, I do have some questions for the applicants' um, advisors, um, and they're going to be the detail, very mm -hmm. specific detail. Uh, but I heard a couple of uh, comments from people that um, are bigger picture, much bigger picture. Um, you know, the, the other approach is sort of a top-down approach and talk about the project itself and then the detail. Would the board like to approach it in that fashion? Okay, great. So which way, I missed it, which way we want to go? Well, let's, let's do the top-down approach and, and talk okay. about the big picture, and then we'll get into the fine detail. I heard a number of comments in regard to having the access not on Hillway, having the access on Route 77, that this project should be flipped and so on. But I, uh, there is a legitimate reason that it's presented the way it is, and I was wondering if our town planner could address some of the issues and if there's any comments also that could um, address why having this project face Route 77, having the traffic coming in and out of this project on Route 77, as opposed to why they're doing it on Hillway. So, you know, given a different site with different topography, absolutely, the building should absolutely be oriented towards Hillway. But the planning board was out there during the site walk. Um, there's less than 200 feet of frontage on Ocean House Road. There's hundreds of feet of frontage on Hillway. Um, the first time uh, town staff heard about this project, the first thing I heard from a couple of town staff people was, they're not putting a driveway there, are they? So that, that section of Ocean House Road is just a really, really tough spot. It's on a hill, the sight distance is poor. If you're coming out of there in the early morning winter, I think any of us who have taken that hill knows that the sun hits you at just the right point. So it's just physically a dangerous place. Um, and I, I know there were several people who sighed um, a little bit of relief that they weren't trying to fit a driveway in there because of the hill, because of the steepness. I, I would like to turn it over to the applicant for a moment because they did a traffic study um, and those people are professional traffic engineers who have to look at things like horizontal and vertical alignment and sight distance. Uh, we did have a traffic um, study done by Main Traffic Resources. Um, they, they found that the, the proposed project um, did not cause any detrimental impacts on, on the flow of traffic. I'm not a traffic engineer myself, so I can't address it specifically, but um, they did submit the traffic study, performed the counts, um, and that study was reviewed by the town engineer, Steve Harding at Sebago Technics. Um, and his comments are provided in the record as well. His, his takeaway was that all the assumptions that main traffic resources made were on the conserv well on the conservative side. And they did the whole analysis and, um, and found that it really would have minimal effect on, on the traffic. Could, from this, you, from this could you elaborate a little on the problems of entering on, from 77? Yes, um, well my sense is that 
with Hillway of two controlled intersections at each end of Hillway, Scott Dyer Road and Route 77. So when you have traffic leaving the site, you have stacking space. It's a, it's a, it's a low mileage, a, a low speed uh, spur uh, versus going directly out onto 77 where your you know, speeds are faster and there's no stacking or, or um, you know, so it's, it, from my perspective, again, not a traffic engineer, it makes sense to be able to come out onto Hillway, go to those controlled intersections before you get out onto 77 in either direction from Scott Dyer or, or out to uh, 77. Did you, oh, sorry. How, how many extra um, trips or car in and out would be involved if, if, if one of these buildings operational? Did Unfortunately, you look at that? I, I, I'm not prepared to speak to that. Um, certainly at the next, you know, we could have the traffic engineer from main traffic resources at the next meeting. But when they did the traffic study, did they not? Did they oh, not certainly. That? Yeah, they did. And what impact did that have? Um, no effect on level of service at the intersections. Sorry, I didn't hear that. And there's no effect, um, no detrimental effect on the level of service at the two intersections. I, I guess it, it's to do with the rate in which traffic that reaches crossover points. Nothing to do with the actual traffic traveling, but the actual interaction between two cars coming in different directions. So of course, and that must have something to do with the randomness of the events. So for example, in a typically the problems always start when you get to a rush hour and everybody tries to use it at one particular time. But during the day, most things are, are okay and flow evenly. Right. So, so a traffic study that we've done, we've done there would have to involve either a rush hour or a, or a, or a, time, a time crunch when everybody wanted to move in which direction. And I'm wondering right. if they did that task. Yes, they did that. Yeah, they, they, they evaluated the peak hour when there's the most traffic peak generated okay. and then looked at the increase in trip ends from the proposed project. You know, they do the survey, uh, the existing counts of traffic, then they, they um, took a conservative approach to estimate summer volumes, added the trip ends, and then they evaluate the intersect safety of the intersections, um, the wait times at the, at the intersections. Um, look, they looked at high crash locations, level of service. Um, so, so forgive me, but that obviously would affect the speed of traffic if you've got longer delays. So from a, fr from a safety point of view, the longer the delays would seem to have a slightly improved safety other, other than cars being able to speed up along there without having to stop. Oh, on 277 versus Hillway? Well, 77 I thought would be a dangerous intersection anyway. Right. Cars coming up and down there would everything the town planner had to say about, about that. Now, I'm just wondering about Hill Way. Um, obviously, it's a narrower road, but I just don't see the amount of traffic coming up and down there from 10 apartments. And right. That's personal, so I'd rather have the, the official, you know, to see what, what the actual Im impact would, professional right. impact would be. And that's what the traffic study did, and that's what you know, main traffic resources could I'm sure she'd be glad to come is there to the next a, meeting. Is but, there a, the report but the report was provided in the section nine. It's in there, Henry. Yeah, and the, and the um, you know, and the review comments by the town engineer are are real insightful as well. You know, talking about the assumptions made and 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 you know his his perspective on on it and and. Uh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to add as well that when we first looked at the site, we looked at several options for uh, egress and access. And, and the concern that I had, and this is before you had your site, well, this was months before, was the exiting site distance as you would have to approach Route 77. You have, you're on a curve, you're actually on the outside of the curve. Um, you've got a grade change and a slope. And we're also looking at an elevated drive that would have had to drop about 12 feet down onto 77. So you take the combination of those three, uh, just from a liability and a safety standpoint, it was really a very simple uh, decision to avoid that catastrophe on Route 77. The fact of the matter is, um, there, I've heard expressions of speed on Hillway. It's my understanding that the town is looking at 
Hill Way is a, is a rebuild. I've seen in many instances where you have a literal fork in the road where the road is actually brought down into more of a 90 at the intersection. I don't know if that's in the current plan, but I think it would go a long way to a, allay the fears of, of the, uh, um, the neighborhood uh, to prevent that. Uh, basically, Route 77, if there's no deceleration going to Hillway, that's, that's the biggest concern. What you have from this property is two driveways that have ample room to stack for any traffic that might be on Hillway. So really, the inconvenience, if you will, would occur on the property waiting to get on the Hillway. The traffic study didn't show that as, as an issue. And as John mentioned, and to your point, they look at the, the levels of service of operation during the peak period when it's likely to occur and they stated that there was no impact. I'm also not a traffic engineer. I don't know if there are any in the audience, but again, I know that your uh, town engineer uh, concurred with the findings. And again, if you wish us to delve into that in more detail, I would only request that you have your expert witness on your end as well. This is really not a subjective thing with traffic. It's a science, and traffic engineers do this all the time. So that's all I have. Thank you. Marie, could you perhaps um, I can. discuss what's going on with respect to the plans for Hillway? I'm looking for the comments that the Public Works Director sent just this afternoon. I know the Planning Board received them. I know that um, we sent them to the applicant <coughs> as well. Um, and no, there's, they're in the stack here. So but I guess I'll just paraphrase him. So the council established goals for the year, I believe it was December 2015, and that was before this project was submitted. So, uh, you know, I, I hear what the uh, members of the neighborhood are hearing, and um, everything you're talking about in terms of safety in Hillway was something that uh, is generally accepted because the council, when they established their 41 goals last December, um, included a goal that says develop a plan for the improvement of Hillway. So uh, the status of that right now is it is just there's nothing done yet. Um, but there was a meeting with the applicant and the town engineer and the public works director and I just to make sure that anything this project was doing on improvements to the other side of Hillway wasn't going to have to be undone or was going to undermine the work the town wants to do. Um, the, the answer is there's no scope of work even developed yet. Um, but it's on the town council's to-do list. Um, it's supposed to be at least begun by October. I know the town, town public works director is working on it now. Uh, when the planning board had their site walk out there, we saw what a delightful sidewalk you have out there. Uh, not good. So, I mean, it, it, there's no scope of work yet, but I think everything that I've heard, all you have to do is go out there in Hillway and see what some of the problems are. You have almost a non-existent sidewalk. It's just, it, it really looks more like a paved shoulder, and you really need something that is above the grade of the road and is separated from the road so kids can walk there safely. Uh, another item that was brought up out of the traffic study by this applicant is the existing condition of the crosswalk at the intersection of Hillway and Route 77, which again, the kindest way I can put it is that a lot of our roads in Cape Elizabeth kind of adhere to a 1960s approach of find the quickest way to move cars. And that, that easy right turn up Hillway makes it possible for people to not slow down when they're getting off of Route 77. And what really needs to happen and what I will advocate for, and I'm not going to pick on anyone, but staff can only do what the council can finance, is that that intersection really needs to be looked at hard because I don't think it would take a lot to get it to be a lot slower. So we've got a problem with that crosswalk, we've got a problem with that intersection, and all of those things are there now, before this project ever came in. And the hope is that uh, the council will authorize funding for an engineering study to actually evaluate Hillway and come up with a scope of work for safety improvements. So that, that is, I, I, if I knew what the scope of work was, I would tell you, um, there is no written scope of work yet. Uh, the council is just now finishing up its budget process, and the expectation and the hope is that there will be some money in that budget to start the work. So that's, that's where I can give you an update on that right now. 
Thank you. Victoria, does that handle your question? These are my high-level questions, but I will have some very okay. detailed we're, we're questions. So if anyone level. else has... Uh, any other board members have... I just one thing that we looked at that I noticed, including the site walk, uh, which, would, which happened about a month and a half ago, uh, was that when you... Anybody who is goes downhill way, uh, sort of north out of town in the morning, could probably reflect on when you look up what Maureen was saying to the right, it is tough to have that pitch on the road. Now, if you push that up about 100 feet, which you would have to do for an entrance, I think you'd agree that it gets even worse. So I think the applicant, in looking at the traffic study um, that is here and is available, and I'd urge people to take a look at it, um, there doesn't seem to indicate that there's going to be a significant impact on Hill Way. What Maureen just said, what I think brings up a bigger point, that the problems that we're hearing from the neighborhood about Hillway being a thorough, being a throughway, people go too fast, they don't want to put their kids out there. Um, that's a bigger concern that goes beyond this application. And I hope that we can address that as a town at a different time, because that's not what we're here to look at now. And those problems existed yesterday, and they're going to exist tomorrow until something gets done with that. So I hope we can all focus on what we're here, and that's what this application is coming up with. So I think looking at what the applicants put together with the two entrances on Hill Way, to me as a board member, it makes the most sense for how this, pro um, how this project is being brought forth in front of this board. That's just my personal view on, on the applicant and Hill Way. So. Thank you. Uh, Caroline? I'm going to go off Hill Way. And one of the, uh, <coughs> one of the People speaking tonight asked a question. They had a concern about a rain garden. They didn't understand what it was. And if you could explain to them what a rain garden is and what its purpose is, I think they'll like the idea. Yeah. You see it here? It's a bit oh, on the oh, maybe on the grading plan. Right there you go. Yeah, the rain garden is, um, is simply a depression. Um, where water will gather, uh, flow down to gather, it's, it's planted with plants, um, and water will, the, the um, elevation, the invert, the rim elevation is a little higher than the, than the base of the rain garden, about six inches higher. Water will come down, um, it's all fully planted, and the idea is that that water will come in and, and seep down through a filter layer and be picked up by underdrain. Um, below the rain garden. There's no standing water, that, so there's no mosquitoes or anything like that. It's not really meant for detention, it's more meant for um, stormwater filtering and stormwater treatment. And it also slows down peak flows somewhat. So, so we added that in from the last, um, the last meeting as well. And we can talk more about the porous pavement as well, but those, both those, their stormwater best management practices are intended to treat stormwater runoff before it um, enters the city system or town system. I have a question, and I'm not sure who this is for, but <clears throat> I know a lot of people were concerned about the size of this project. And um, one of the things I was wondering, and maybe I missed this at some point, is how this is considered two buildings, how the connector piece drops out as a consideration of it being a single building? I don't remember how we came to that conclusion. So, look, I mean, almost word for word what our existing town center zoning says right now was adopted in 95. And shortly after that, we did have a project on the north side of town hall proposed. Um, it was eventually approved. And um, the plan X actually was very well received by the planning board. But that's when the issue was raised. Can you have a connector between buildings? And the town center plan always recognized that you could have multiple buildings on the same lot. Uh, the question was, well, can you connect them? And how much of a connection is now it's all one building or not one building? And it really is the planning board's call on whether this is a connector or something more. Uh, but we have repeatedly seen proposals where people have been allowed to put multiple buildings on the single lot and they've been allowed to do something with the connector that 
doesn't look like it's just one big building. So, Does that help at all? Mm -hmm. But this was something that got discussed with the code enforcement officer years and years ago. It's been through a planning board But it's not stated in the zoning ordinance anywhere. There's no, no. requirement. The, the zoning ordinance says that you can, your, your building can have no more than a 5,000 square foot. Right, right. but there's, not, there's no talk about a connector or minimum distance between the buildings. No, the, the that's that's the planning board's purview to. I will I will look for yeah I will look you know, for the I'll exact language. Go, I'll look at that this afternoon so you don't. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to. Joe, you, know, you can have the two buildings. You might count the So we're at list maximum building footprint of five thousand square feet. It says this limitation shall not prohibit the connection of a separate structure by a covered or enclosed walkway. What page is that? I don't know because I have an excerpt. You have a stair in yours though, right? Yeah, because of the grade change, it connects the parking on one level down to the medical space down below. It's a connector down to the medical office buildings. When we're, we're talking about big, uh, big picture stuff, I just want to make one comment. There were a number of the folks here who spoke tonight both in favor and against the uh, application, had a lot of questions about should, what if anything should be done with this parcel, if it was going to be developed, how much of it should be developed, and, and who makes those decisions. The, um, the, the social contract, if you will, is that a person who owns land can do with it what the law permits. And we have, a, we have land use laws, zoning, subdivision, site plan, environmental laws and the like, and that really is what constrains the owner of the land and what they can do. Once they meet the recipe set forth in these requirements, they're allowed to do it, and it's, it's not our call to say, gosh, you know, just looking at this thing, it just looks like it's a little bit too big. We don't, in our system of government, have that power. And I don't think anybody in the board is indifferent to any of the concerns expressed tonight by the people in the neighborhood, nor are we indifferent to the uh, business plans of the of the developers of the lot. It's it's a balancing act that we we, we try hard to live with. Uh, the the safety issue we've covered, and that's that's a big one for us. The visual uh, effect of this project is a big one for us, and we'll be talking about the landscaping and screening and buffering and whatnot to make this this building sort of fit within the landscape. But it, it's not a black and white thing. You, you do have to appreciate that the, we have a system of laws that guides what we have to do. Um, so nobody's interests are being overlooked. They, they may or may not be satisfied by the final decision, but we, we try hard to balance everybody's interests. OK. Uh, no, ma'am, the public comment period has passed. If we have a little time. At, hmm? Uh, we'll, we'll be getting on, on, on the list of stuff we'll be talking about is is the, the traffic study. Thank you. Okay. Um, there, there was one comment that struck me from a gentleman who suggested pollution. Was talking about the balconies having stuff stored on them, and I can understand that that it could look they could look strange. Um, and I wonder if at some stage um, the owners of the building could, could address that, but just something that it struck me as, you know, it could be viewed as a, an eyesore if people put too much stuff on the balconies. But that's my comment. Yeah, I, I take Henry to be saying, would the applicant have some type of tenant regulations that would require the, the, the balconies and other tenant spaces to be uh, kept in an orderly fashion? Okay. Thank you, Henry. Jonathan. And just one thing further on what Peter said. It, 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 the tough thing about being on this board sometimes is that when you get an applicant who owns a property has done everything that they possibly can to be within the regulations, have listened to public comments, have listened to planning board comments, have uh, 
gone on site walks with the planning board and really bent over backwards um, to do what they are looking to do and then have people who come up and obviously disagree with it, which rightfully they have a right to do. It's tough to balance those sorts of things. Um, that said, is, uh, my personal view of this is this has been property that's been zoned as town center since 95. It went on sale um, by the previous owners who had been in this town for a very long time. Friends of mine, I grew up playing basketball in that driveway of that what's called the farmhouse now. But when property shifts and property goes to somebody else, you, to me, it's, it's something that you balance the community, but you also have to respect private property rights too. I think that what we've heard is glowing reviews of uh, the applicants from a personal standpoint, but looking at what they've done and what they're offering this town, um, I, I think what they've done and what they're applying to do is something that I can support because they've not just been good, they've considered everything when it comes to this town and what's in the regulations that they're allowed to be zoned for. And I can understand if you're in a butter that it could be a tough pill to swallow. However, that's, um, it's something that, to me, as a neighbor, you have to respect. You know, this is probably a segue into one of the other uh, more detailed points. <coughs> Pardon me, but I was hoping the applicants might give a little more detailed discussion of the uh, landscaping and planting plan. When you see the, as a lot of you folks have seen the elevations and the plans, and when they're just starkly presented, it looks like this gigantic, god awful mass of building. And I believe, at least as I understand the plans, uh, between the retained existing trees and, and foliage and the very extensive amount of additional planting uh, that's intended for the property that the, the visual impact from Hill Way, which I think is what has some of you folks upset, is actually perhaps not uh, quite as bad as you think and it, it, you may end up with a fairly attractive um, frontal look at the, the, the part of the building where the, uh, the chiropractic uh, practice will be conducted. Could you walk us through uh, in a little more detail the, you know, identifying the types of plants and how big they are and so forth and so on? I know this is sure. detailed. Let me zoom back out a moment here. Um, in, your, in your packet, <clears throat> there's a planting plan uh, that's keyed to the uh, schedule that is also included on that planting plan. Uh, I think what you'll find is that in meeting with the tree warden and looking at the ordinance requirements, uh, following the site walk, looking at the topography, looking at the existing vegetation, what we've attempted to do, uh, at least around the perimeter of the project, is meet the requirements for the, uh, the plantings within the right-of-way that are a requirement of the subdivision. So along Hill Way, you'll see that we have to either uh, identify and recognize existing trees or in absence of those provide new. And that's what you're seeing down in this lower area of focus here. And again, as a result of your site walk and as a result of a fairly extensive review from the tree warden uh, and discussions with our landscape architect, uh, this is the preferred plan. Um, John, if you have a, do you, do you have the, the full or, or a half size sheet where you could read, for instance, um, it's, it's actually a little blur. Yeah, so that's what we'll do. And um, I'll let John call out, for instance, the three, the three that you see along uh, Hillway as an example. Those are intended to be a street tree. Uh, While, while they're looking for those plans, if I could add something. Sure. Um, the board is aware of this, and I don't know if the public's aware of this, but the, the planning board has been working for months on um, probably the most boring set of amendments we've ever worked on. They're called technical amendments. Um, they're, they're numbingly boring. But one of the things that we've been working on is there is a list of approved street trees, and we've been able to have, uh, we just have an incredibly talented tree warden right now 
Uh, some of you might have seen his picture on the cover of the Press Herald last December. He's the expert on winter moths right now. Um, he is a licensed forester. He's you know, spending a lot of time doing work with our trees. And because we were working on this ordinance amendment, we were updating our list of trees. Because some of the trees on there really just don't fit well in a new development. He came, met with the planning board. He's looking at climate change issues. He's trying to, he's inventorying all the town trees in the community. And as part of that work, he came to the planning board and said, I really want to look hard at this tree list. I want the town to start thinking uh, a little more longer term about the kind of trees we should be planting that would be more disease resistant, more able to sustain climate changes. And um, it was a very, I think, I speak for the board, it was a very interesting um, session. And while I was listening to him uh, go over this, it occurred to me that um, here was a wonderful resource to actually look at a development plan. So this is the only plan he's ever reviewed and prepared a five-page memo of comments, which we then provided the applicant and said, do something with these comments. So this plan has actually gotten a much more thorough review, not just of the new types of trees, but of ways to better preserve the existing trees. So we work hard to get people to try to preserve the trees through construction, but now we have this whole extra layer of review by our tree warden, and there are some techniques you guys have added to these plans that we've never seen before to better protect the trees we're trying to preserve. And you know, let's say the worst happens and a tree is identified on the plan as to be preserved and it dies during construction. Um, the town has the authority to require the applicant to replace that tree. So while we do want to preserve mature trees, um, if, if the worst happens, it's not like, oh well, tried. Um, a, a remediation plan has to then come in to try to fill in those gaps that were, that were left open because the trees didn't survive. But this is a pretty hefty review. This is never, I've never been involved in a five page memo from the tree warden before, so. And I would just like to say that our landscape architect, Paul Brody, um, he was very respectful of the tree warden's review. Um, there really, it, it, it was, he followed the, uh, the guidance provided by the uh, zoning documents. However, uh, what you have before you now is uh, not only meeting with that, but it also takes into account a little more diversity uh, per the input from the tree warden. The locusts, which are the three, uh, they're shade master locusts that are on Hillway, <clears throat> by example, those are bald and burlap, two and a half to three inch caliper plantings the day they're put in the ground. So that's, that's the, the street plantings. Um, over on Ocean House Road, uh, there are um, proposals <coughs> to preserve as much as possible. In fact, the relocation of the side, uh, the entrance walk that was brought up at, uh, by you folks at the last meeting uh, from a ledge outcrop session. What we also found when we were out there is that we were actually able to work around the drip edge a little better from another tree. So another tree was saved over in that location as a result of that re relocation. Um, we narrowed the circular drive. Uh, the original plan showed, I believe, we had a, a 20 to a 24 foot wide uh, drive around here that's been pulled back to 18 feet so basically two nine-foot lanes um, uh, to, again, pull that back and also to move the sidewalk back over here. So we've actually pulled the impact away by at least six feet from that tree line, again, to move out of the drip edge and all that. So uh, again, there's been a, uh, an unfathomable amount of time spent from a planting standpoint just at uh, what is put not only for the um, Preservation wherever uh, there's zero impact, but also out of the drip edge, but also uh, care has been taken for things that people won't even see from, from Hillway. Again, this, there's about a three foot uh, berm, if you will. Um, so in other words, if you're standing here on Hillway, at least in this point right here, uh, up through about here, this is a bit of a mound. That's the existing grades. It's about three feet higher than the center line of Hillway as you go up. When you're, when you're at this location on Hillway at ele elevation 95, uh, if you're standing 
Uh, you're a little higher than seated in a vehicle. Seated, you're approximately three feet off ground at 98. You're basically two feet below the second elevated floor, not the lower level. So you're basically looking at that, that deck plane. And what you have down below you uh, in, in, in grading and embankments, and as John called it, sort of an amphitheater, as Jocelyn mentioned, as an amphitheater, we've got uh, uh, slope plantings, greens. Uh, there's a set of stairs that goes down in. Again, the, the thing to remember <clears throat> is that this is tucked into the side of the hill. It's not sitting on top of the hill. It's literally, literally cut into the side of the hill. In fact, this whole elevation here, as you look at it, is actually, you're looking at a, a, a patio that serves the units that are on the, I'll call it the 100 elevation, with this being the 90 elevation. The 90 elevation lives down in here. Uh, this is actually at and slightly higher than Hillway in this location, um, at the, I'm sorry, the 100 elevation. So you exit onto a, a patio and then there's a, a basically a planted uh, embankment here, much like a front yard, again, meeting with the standards that slopes down to Hillway. So you're actually looking up at a, what would traditionally be a two-story residential structure. Again, the commercial side is really down, almost fully contained in this, this lower level um, as far as vis visibility. And I do think one of the things we did by turning off, oh shoot, let me get out of here a minute. Turning off, again, we focused on the eliminating the, the tree opacity because your focus was on the, the architectural standard of the building. And it occurred to us in talking uh, as of late that there's been a lot of concern about what would you see from, from Hillway. Uh, a lot of folks were talking about, you know, as they walked out Ran Road and entered. So what you see here, <clears throat> and these are the larger existing trees uh, that are being preserved in that, that mounded area that I just described. And then these, this is one, two, and then there's a third of these locusts. Now, is this a locust in the model? Not exactly, but I have to say, uh, if you Google a locust, you'll see that it's uh, somewhat similar to this in uh, profile and density when it's, when it's there. So you will see veiled looks through at the building. What you don't see here is, um, again, the reality of when you're on the site, there's about a two to one exaggeration for what, when you look at a map or in a <clears throat> 3D elevation, we left this at a one-to-one, -one, so it's a literal one-to-one -one representation. We did not exaggerate the scale, but for anyone that's looked at uh, topography or things, it just whenever you look at a map, it always seems too flat from, from reality. What you'll really see here is the fact that this is down, you, in fact, you can't see it. It's down behind the, the green here, down in that elevation 90. John, did you have anything like else to, to add to that? Just a point on this, on this image that it doesn't show all the understory in there, and there's no plans to to cut back on the understory um, on there. So I think it looks even a little bit more open than it will once, because that, that area is really staying out of that area completely. And if you look um, at So can you go back to the planting plan one second? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So you're talking about the understory right in this area? Yeah, that's right, right in this area. And that's where that view from Rand over in that direction. I'm glad you raised concerns about uh, the grade, when you do that grading to cut the amphitheater, about cutting into the roots of some of those trees in there. In this area? Um, those were adjusted from the first presentation and even the second. You'll see is that where these grades tie in uh, within the drip edge, you will not see uh, contours cutting into the drip edge, which is right. sort of the uh, we, we don't like ever to get within or more than 30% of impact inside a drip edge. In, in this case, for these, we're, um, again, given the survey and the distance we were given for the drip edge, it appears to me, except for maybe 15% uh, of this lowest tree that's right at the intersection where we're, we're not even cutting a foot, that we're not in that drip edge in those locations, at least for the larger trees. And following the... The, the site visit with the tree warden, there's some big oaks up in this area, and, and that drive comes through. And one of the solutions is to put a perforated pipe um, around the, you know, where, you're, where we're filling in underneath in the drip edge. This perforated pipe plan to, to go around there to provide air circulation to the, 
Okay. To the just show surface. where Rand Road is. Um, only right around in this area. Are there any of the mature big oaks on the hillway side of this project left? Yes. Where might it be left when you have yes. this uh, Pardon me, sir. They're all. The, the, the public part is all. Oh. Yeah, there's a 30 inch. Just to, I guess, to answer a question from the board, right the, the, those trees, there's a. If you look at sheet LP 101, you'll see noted that there's a 40 inch oak, a 30 inch, and a, uh, a 15. And a 15. There's a nice hickory in there too that, that'll be staying. And the other, one of the other comments to the tree warden that some of the ash trees um, may not last. The help is not. Help. So where he suggested planting some hickories in place of where those ash trees are now. So that's that's an example right there of one of the hickories that we're planting. In you know, if, if that happens to, um, if one of those ash trees, you know, their health is questionable. Well, this is off topic from what we're talking about here. So if anybody oh, has anything oh. related to this. Yeah, Victoria. I do. Um, I would like to talk about the view from Route 77. That view, um, are you, are you making an attempt to buffer when you're a car or a pedestrian is walking on 77? Are you attempting to buffer so that you can't see this project? Or are you attempting something like an aesthetically pleasing transition from a public right away to the private right away? Which one are you attempting to do? Right, so the current plan shows, <clears throat> these are planted down at about uh, three to anywhere from three to four. How many feet down below the finished floor of the, the, resi uh, the 100 elevation, John. What are these. those? And those are... Um, spruce. Those spruce. are evergreens? Spruce. Yeah, those are the evergreens, and I'm looking at the elevation here. I think those are... I oh, guess I'm a little... Uh, so they're, they're really screening, screening the ones? corner of the commercial corner, so that, in effect, you're looking over what is really a screen, intended as a screen under this plan, to screen maybe the lower story of that corner of the building. So what you're seeing is a two-story residential from Ocean Hill. How much will it screen? Um, will it go all the way and screen all the top? I mean, well, I'm a little concerned about evergreens that right, close when, to right. the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are... I don't know if there's some other type of planting, but, um, and I'd like to hear the, the, you sure. know, any reaction from the board, but I'm a little concerned about evergreens that appear very close to the building. Right, so that's why we actually proposed two options because what we're we're sort of getting two. It's somewhat internal to the site, but it impacts what is seen from Ocean House Road. Um, in some of the comments received, the formal comments from the tree warden, it appeared that there was more of a screening approach desired. However, in some of the conversation to the you folks, um, there was um, a sense that a carefully designed opening, if you will, that would be more in feeling like a manicured or a, or a residential front yard. So what we have are actually almost two, two opposing views here. You have this, which has the evergreens, which if, again, if properly maintained, like any foundation planning that's, if not cut, will be over an eave height. It, it's, it has to be properly maintained. Again, uh, these are planted almost at the lower elevation. If properly maintained, those can be kept so that they're uh, not obscuring the view of the, the residential stories, if you will. They're down below the driveway. They're down below this parking lot. And as you're looking up a hill, what you have to remember is you're looking up a fairly uh, large incline here. You're almost looking over the top of those at the structure. This rendering, again, at the one-to-one -one uh, d right here, whoops, it's, it doesn't show, I mean, this goes down below. So these evergreens are sort of down in a, in a zone on the other side of the driveway, down three or four feet right around here. So what they would screen is probably, you know, this portion of the building it would break up this corner of the building. So your focus and our thought and our, uh, the, the cues we were getting were that you would see this part. In fact, we brought the, the walk and sweeped it in through here. So what we're now hearing is maybe a little more open, maybe a little more ornamental flowering trees. We've given uh, two options that use more of a, a fruit tree. There's some apple. Uh, one is ranging a more formal uh, 
setting here that sort of draws you into the walk, and this one's more of a, a Baroque session where you have almost uh, two side plantings. So we're willing to go in either direction. We just would like some direction from the board because the ordinance <coughs> is not, the, there, the, there is not a buffer requirement <coughs> that is, <coughs> uh, we feel that we've met the, the, the yard. This is getting internally in the site and it's really affecting what is more of a feature. Again, that feature, if you recall, was added for the pedestrian connection on Ocean House Road to an existing sidewalk and also to provide that visual connection that you desired at, I believe, our first or second workshop. So, so can, I think op yeah, option one is blocking and option two? No, nope, option one, option these, one uh, the existing plan, if you will, is more of a buffer, more of a visual screen. It closes it in. And it, okay, so it option brings it in one is tight. more buffering. So and option not two. Option, no, no, the existing so the, the current proposal is more blocking. Okay, current is And what we have are really two options and just really different configurations that one is a little more open. Uh, and again, it brings a much broader feeling of, of, a, of a front yard that's uh, uh, ornamental out to Ocean House Road. This one is, is a little uh, more uh, I won't say refined, but subdued from that. It's, it's not quite as formal. I think Both there options are, there are, are meant to provide a framing, you know, a view <laughs> for the building. Yeah, instead of screening. Option one, a little bit more color, a little bit more. These are the same, <coughs> same plantings, just arranged in a different fashion. So okay. it's really, but again, these are more of the colorful, the flowering, the fruit. We don't have any directly over sidewalks that leads to issues with tracking and birds and other things on the walk that we don't want to have in the. Well, one thing, maybe we can get some comment on this or questions. I think the, the concept in the <coughs> village center is that the space between the front of the building and the, and the main street, 77, if you will, should be attractively landscaped. And I think there the ornamental plantings would be very important. <coughs> on the other side, on the hillway side, I, I think the, the emphasis ought to be, and perhaps even more than you have now, is for screening. Mm -hmm. It would be for at least to at the eye level, so you're, it's not like you're looking at a three-story building. So what we have here is the right to the T. In fact, it almost came out of your town center playbook for the the visual <coughs> that's created. It's a little hard to see here, but what you have is actually uh, the profile of um, Hillway. This is this is taken at the face of the building. At Hillway, the grade would actually continue down, and, and this is going to be almost impossible to, to draw here in a straight line, but basically Hillway is at about this elevation at this point, and then slopes down along here till it intercepts down about the lower driveway. So you can see how much lower that is than the Hillway profile. So this part, which is fairly close to Hillway, uh, as required, has to be within 25 to 35 feet. Um, that planting scheme is much more residential. It's a, it's a patio. It has uh, the types of plantings that you envision in the town center, and it brings it right out to the street. It has a, a set of stairs. We believe that this area here meets almost, again, it's right out, out of your diagram for town center and, and what you envision bringing to the street. The other identifiable entrance for this uh, footprint here traverses here through a walk up a set of stairs as well. So this portion also, and there are many examples in town where the house is not higher than the road, it sets back a little bit and is maybe down, where you have the same thing where you go down and, and into the structure. So really these two situations, one is elevated, one is down, they really represent the two situations that you find not only in the town center guidelines, but also elsewhere in town with residential landscape. This area, with exception, is because of the preservation, is as it is. The grades are left where they are. It just happens that they're slightly higher than the road, and it just happens that this is where the, the 30 and the 40 and the 15 inch oak and other trees are kept. Uh, and we failed to mention right at the entrance as well, more of a screening as you come uphill way, but there's also um, some uh, flanking plantings here that are uh, probably in the three to five foot height range. So I wouldn't call them an understory by any means, but they're certainly taller than a ground cover. So that actually helps fill it in as well. So really we have that, that situation, the lower entrance to the building situation here. Remember, this is our front. This is 
we have several fronts, but what we're trying to do is, is um, acknowledge your request not to ignore Ocean House Road, even though in our mind it's, it's really not the back because we've designed all sides of the building to act like the front. It also feels like sort of an entrance or, or a front yard, if you will, uh, from Ocean House Road. It's not just blocked off. So we, uh, what we're hearing is to allow more of the view of the building by eliminating uh, some of the evergreens and maybe keep one as a specimen tree like you might have where you're not trying to block the structure, where you're trying to reveal the structure. And again, more ornamentals uh, down in this area, more flowering, more colorful. And again, we would, we would come back with really, I think the selection was in concert with our landscape architects chat with the tree warden and subsequent discussions with staff and others through input. So really it's a matter of um, preference on, on, on how it's arranged. And we, we could come back with either of these. And as you'll see here, they did remove uh, the, the five or the four or five evergreens here. And I think except one. So my question for the board is, do you want what, we, what they currently are showing or do you want to go with an option one or an option two? Can I make a point before? Yeah. So when we first started talking about um, the presence of this entrance on 77, I think mean, we talked about, even though the, the cars are not entering there, that it is a significant pedestrian entrance. And I think, in my mind at least, I was thinking of something quite a bit bigger and grander in terms of an entry. Not, uh, maybe possibly even a, something with a cover to it that you walk through and under. And I feel like the, the pickets, the little picket fences are really just not quite cutting it. So right, so what we have is a, and again, the rendering that we were able to pull, uh, the, these are the placeholders to show location. Uh, what we're looking at is, uh, and you'll see in the plantings, that it's, it's something much more residential, much more Yeah, but that's, gate. that's like the corner of a lot in the suburbs. I don't, but, I don't see well, that as a... Again, our, our landscape architecture, <laughs> you show two of these flanking the drive. Yeah. It feels like a gate. It feels like a path. I guess you, you mentioned a substantial amount of pedestrian travel here. Um, most of the... Uh, destination, if you will, for other services in town are headed up Hill Way. With the new sidewalk on yeah, Hill Way... Yeah, it's not actual, it's virtual, as you drive by it. Exactly. And this, uh, how used this will be, I don't know, but I think from a visual <coughs> standpoint, we're satisfied that uh, these flanking the walk, as opposed to just a flat walk with just planting, absolutely will signify the fact that it's, it's a path. There'll be no question that it's flanking it as a path. I gotta agree with Joe. I'm not. I don't know if you need that fence, so I want to look at the landscaping options. But once again, I want to throw this out to. I want to hear from everybody. I, or, morning, I, I actually like your idea of having a cover at the top and making it a focal point because then it takes the eye up there and it looks like there's a, a real entrance there. It it's like a. a not a trellis, a, but a, a I, yeah. I mean, I, I read it. When he said it, I thought a garden, right. a garden entrance gate or something. That well, you know, I think it just just adds that panache to it. I had a sense, Joe. Correct me if I'm wrong. That we looked at it, and the layout is a little bit unusual because of the 77 and Hill Way. But sort of in in concept, if not reality, the front of the project for the commercial side was Hill Way because that's sort of where it looks in the, for the residential units above, really the front yard, if you will, is looking out at 77. Right, and I think But I don't think actually too many people are going to come no, but grouping up and down 77. Making that into something was a way of compromising. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, to me, with, with plantings, that would be a nice thing. The idea of a bigger and more elaborate overhead or something, I, I don't see the point because I don't think it's going to be used a whole lot for it's a visual approaching problem. the building. But it's yeah. visual, not so much for use. It's a visual impact. And it also, you know, it's for a visual impact and it also would, would reduce to a degree the size of the building because you'd see this right up front and the other is removed so you get the optical illusion that the building is smaller. Okay, I'm going to go the opposite way. 
Um, I think, to me, what's important is to reduce the mass of the building as you're driving up 77. Um, I'm not a landscape architect, so how you do that, um, I'm not 100% certain. Having an entrance into that walkway that with plantings, um, to me it doesn't even need a fence. Plantings on either side of a walkway would cover it. Um, so I'm kind of on the other side. I, I understand uh, Victoria's point about too many evergreens up too close to the building, but I think they're important uh, to kind of um, cut off the size to help with the scale of the building from that perspective. So and, that and wasn't much help, was it? Well, we're, we're, we're sort of getting input through the locations. And I know the ordinance is it's really very subjective in that area. Um, our responsibility to our applicant is to meet the standard, to uh, take your cues and to try to uh, where some of those maybe subjective areas to, to go there. I will say that we did present uh, early on at the first or second workshop our intent for the path and what we were proposing, what we brought before you is consistent to that. Um, I'd leave it up to the applicant. I mean, we can, my concern is that um, we have other issues that um, are uh, uh, capital expenditures by the applicant that are not on the property that have been made as part of the requirements of the ordinance. And this one is um, maybe what I would suggest is that we, we, what we've done meets or exceeds uh, any written requirements. And it, again, at this point, it's subjective. I think I, I can stand here before you and say that you'll absolutely know that there's a walk there, that it, that it identifies the entrance to a walk, and that with either option one or two, that it is, is colorful, vibrant. Uh, one of the elements, uh, as you mentioned, approaching is the gateway property. I heard that mentioned earlier. We have Viburnum. We have, for Scythia, we've got a fairly, uh, again, to the extent that we're not planting on the town property over here, um, this, this edge here, so as you're looking up, as you're coming up and sweeping up Ocean House Road, uh, you're basically looking over a, what should be a fairly colorful uh, planted uh, area across this whole facade and looking up at, again, up at that second, third, more of the residential look, yes. Yeah. So am I hearing that you are going to go with either option one or option two? There's really three options. The one right, that was proposed. The, so that's why I'm wondering. Right, are there's you going the current through? proposal, which right. if, if you're fine with it, we feel it meets. We felt um, that it was um, providing the, the cues from both the tree warden for more of a yeah. visual screen and breaking yeah. up the mass. Uh, but what we're hearing today is that you want something more visual, more open, if you will, the Ocean House, which these options are providing a new uh, insertion of plant types. So are you still looking for direction from we would the love board? Direction on that. <laughs> okay, and then I'm kicking it back to the board again. Does the board want to go with what's current or option one or option two? Thank you. Let me make one, one suggestion, at least just for me personally. I, th I think that what's in the plans right now isn't, isn't quite it. And I think what would be really good if you come back with a plan, <clears throat> excuse me, that would take option one or two, or, you know, what your recommendation for meeting Carolyn's point about breaking up the lines of the corner a bit, but more focusing on ornamental plantings, so that when you drive uh, south in 77, you're coming into Cape Elizabeth, you see this area, you think, well, that's attractive. That really looks good. Then I would, I, I would I take option one. One though? of these options yeah, but the, would be. Se the second half of the thing is I, if you would rethink, think a little bit more about the amount of screening that is going in on Hill Way. <clears throat> so that if you're standing on the street in Hill Way looking at the, at the property, how, what can you do about you know, breaking the mass of the building with, with street side plantings? Right, um, so to, to further enhance the screening. So I'd like to break that up if I could into the really the three different situations. Uh, I presume you're not talking about the area where we are no. uh, required to bring the building right to the street. You would no. not screen no. that or there would be... No. It would that's be, fine. Unless this this area as well where we go, um, you're going down uh, four yeah. to five or six feet below that's grade. <clears throat> it's really this area yeah. here that you're looking for maybe some supplementals. Again, to uh, the point where we're not... In the back disturbing um, 
where are you referring here? Does, does anyone have any questions about the plantings on Hillway? On Hillway. Well, no. I think well Peter do you? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that and this was mentioned by one of the speakers. I think you're going to need a site section that really shows that relationship of the sidewalk. Well, actually, right through Rand Street, that would include maybe two or three houses on Rand Street, the street, I, yeah. and the relationship with that sidewalk and going down into the building. And what we've done here is actually a little bit better. This is actually a uh, 3D model of the property and the surrounds that shows you what you'll see when you're standing. Well, but you don't see... You well, don't it, see the buildings on Rand Street. You don't have a sense of... Right. Our, again, um, the concern that I understand is not what I see of the, the abutting properties. The concern is what they see of our property, which is the purpose for this. I, I guess um, I'm a little concerned that we're modeling or rendering things, and I don't want to dismiss the need to look all around, but there, the, the time and um, effort to put this together for this application. We believe these uh, go uh, far and above over what's required to demonstrate what's been done for the plant. Well, there's the an enormous plant. amount of angst expressed over the size of this building. And I think a site section would go a long way in helping people see what's going on. I think it would benefit you. Can I, can I just ask one question about this picture here? Is this from the sidewalk? Is it from the middle of Hillway? Is it from across the street of Hillway? This is taken right at the intersection of Rand Road and Hillway on the uh, Rand Road side of Hillway. On the west side. On okay. the west side. All right. This would be where you would be standing if you walk out Rand Road right before you turn and go up the hill. Okay, so I'm looking across Hillway at the location. That's correct. All right. That doesn't show any uh, lower shrubbery no. type. Right. That's correct. This is yeah. the larger yeah. trees that are protecting all that. Right. We could either. absolutely provide you an update with with the uh, corner plantings, which would infill some of this corner. Again, we really don't want to get into putting too much under there. Now we're getting to the root system that we aren't supposed to disturb. So that's that's sort of a. Well, I, I just want to have the board. I want to wrap this up tonight. I really hate to bring them back. We're having our public hearing, so I don't know how the rest of the board feels about just trying to wrap this up tonight and just do you want what's well, current, option one, building, option two? Yeah. Yeah, right, we haven't even gotten to lighting, we haven't gotten That's to. What I was do you just want to. Can the board I, please pipe in on? Yeah, I just wanted to say. Um, Maureen made reference to the new tree warden's report. And while I think it's wonderful that we now have a tree warden who is going into this extensive detail, I actually think it goes significantly beyond what our ordinances presently require. And I think this applicant has actually gone above and beyond what has happened in the town in the past to provide these various renderings, these various options, come back several times. And we have other issues to talk about tonight. But at least on the tree option, I think it would be wrong to require the applicant to come back yet another week with yet another set of drawings on this particular issue. I think we should just give them some direction and then leave it for perhaps some kind of final review um, by the town. You know, like we often leave some things unresolved, but it seems to me that what we're trying to do is do we want screening of that three-story corner? Yes, we'd like some, but we also need to respect what the town center zone says that you're trying to create a villagey kind of entrance look on 77. So we want both, but we don't want it. We can't have everything. So it's a balance between those two. It's not an either or. And to me, that's the direction. And I think you're coming quite close to that with your option one. So um, right, one thing we could do that um, might help, and it's done on any of our uh, projects such as this, uh, publicly funded projects. Uh, we were we require that prior to planting that all the locations are basically staked out and located on the site. If it would be uh, a pleasure to the board, we would be glad to have the review of that uh, include not only our landscape architect, 
that would approve of those before planting, again, not costing the applicant additional dollars to move, but saying this is where we really want it to go. We've been, uh, they've been very open to uh, the substitutions in kind and in size, if you will, with the tree warden, and I see no reason why if, if, if there's a preference to locate three or four things further this way and that way, it's no additional, it's not rework, it hasn't been done yet, that's the time to do it. That's where it can really, what I'm concerned of is that we're trying to do on paper what is probably best done right, as you saw in your site walk, right down on the ground where you see, you know, right here is gonna fill that in or that's gonna block it. And I can tell you with the, with the planting schedule and the location here, somebody I presume at the town level is gonna go down through these and say, were these all put on, on the site once approved? So we know you're getting these in this basic location and we will specifically want to know where they go. So again, I would offer that out as it, it's not a, uh, it's really allowing you the assurance that things are just where they want to be within, you know, with, we're not, I, I guess it's fine to move it from one end of the site to the other. We just need to know where, where's that going? But right now, this is where the, the sort of the master plan is going. If but I can, think we can also give you a sense as to where we're leaning here. Personally, I think, Option one is kind of looking good as long as it still provides some screening for that corner of the building that will probably look a little bit massive from I, the I see that one as more of a keyhole, and that's what I heard is you, to have it both ways, you have a glimpse of the building, a tasteful glimpse through what is truly a keyhole. You have a fairly open area here, but then you also have the existing plantings that exist here and here. You have a walkway through, and what are you seeing when you look through that at the building? That's really the focus, as opposed to just trying to block that up. So, yeah, because yeah. we have a lot of other. Yeah. 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 Can I suggest that we agree in principle that we would like to see something along the line of option one? Great. After you've thought about our discussions, absolutely. So, are we assuming they're coming back just to present? No. Or are we just going to say we like option one and move on? Yeah, that's what I would say. Like Does the board, yeah, are we? Yes, <laughs> Victoria. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on then. Uh, well, well uh, would we say okay. option, right. option one, we're good on, on landscaping? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. I have other questions. Are you people good on the, on the well. screening on the back side? Yes, let's give them some direction mm -hmm. and move on. Yes. Okay. <laughs> option one. Enjoy. Good. Great. All right, my other, my other question <laughs> while you're up here, Could, uh, there was a concern brought up by one of the neighbors about um, the location of any sort of a garbage dump or not dump, but dumpster. storage. Dumpster. Uh, dumpster, dumpster, thank you. <laughs> and I just was hoping you could point that out on the plan. I know where it is, but I would right. to tell the public. So again, this plan is a little bit out of phase, um, but it does show up uh, better on this. I can then switch over to the black and white. It's shown over here. So that's a far end by the Cumber Cumberland Farm, old Cumberland Farms. Right, the old Cumberland Farms is here. It's against, uh, and again, this is um, out of our control, but vegetated and probably with the setbacks, not much could ever go there. Um, it's also in a place where the truck can uh, get in, back in, remove, and then take it out uh, with turnaround. It's also <coughs> as far back from Hillway as we can get over here. Okay, and my other question, I was hoping you could um, address the, any exterior lighting. So, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're all LEDs. We're all correct. cutoffs, yeah. down facing. Uh, basically, it would comply with the dark skies requirement of a publicly funded project in the state of Maine. So, no upward facing lighting. Okay, and there, there was a study done just for That's the right public. A paper. photometric plan was submitted as part of the package. But Maureen has a comment on that. You had a couple of places where you leaked over at 0.5 foot candles over the property line. I'm assuming that you cut can offs. do what you need to do to make that work. They need cutoffs at those Thank locations. Thank you. Right. Um, I was looking at the lighting plan, and um, the town engineer made this request when we were first here, and it wasn't added to the plan. I'm assuming you're going to be adding it, but um, you took off the labels. You once had labels that said A, oh, A1, oh, A2. I would actually like to see on your isometric <coughs> plan uh, um, something like you do with your plantings. I right. want to well, see labels, the A, the A1, the A2, the come back in, on. Right. Those, I those were key. actually not light types. Um, right, those were, <laughs> were they? Those were reference to the, um, the level 
the basement, the basement the apartment first. levels, floor and second floor. I still like them. So. Anything that we'll say is that last time you had like five of these. I mean, just sure. like with your planting, yep. I'd like to see a key that so our uh, code Maybe enforcement I officer can take out your isometric and they can say there's the five of these right. types. And then I want the manufacturer's type so they know exactly yep. what it is. I also want to have on that, um, right. see, it would also have, so the lighting labels. So we, um, I want the wattage, so we know exactly what the wattage should be. Um, also, the height of each of the uh, mountings. Right. So, so, on, so on sheet CU 101, we took off the confusing D for basement. You is have that a what light, all that was? You have a light schedule. Right. It's on the sheet in the upper left corner. It lists type A, A1, and A2. It lists the height, the wattage, the type of lighting. Can it's, that be on your isometric? Uh, it's, well, it's on our utility plan, which is the, the guiding document for the construction that we could transfer that over there if you wish for the final um, would that be confusing just any time we show it twice it's apt to be missed if we correct it once so well, if you keep it in one location so yeah the, usually the, on the, the, if you're concerned if you want it for ease of reviewing 0.5 foot candles it's better in the isometric plan but if you want to actually get it built correctly it's better where they've put it I guess we'll go with that, but as long as all of that was there, because I didn't see like mounting height and total numbers. It's, it's there. all there, and, and the cut sheets are part of the okay. submittal. And I did have okay. a question. There are absolutely no lights on this building. Well, we're showing the site lights. Just the, yes, I so, agree. But not the so there are absolutely no lights when you walk up to the door. Right, like you have a porch and an overhang. You're saying there are no well, lights. Well, I'm not saying no. that. I okay, because I did not. The architects who are still designing the building and may not have ah. come there yet on, on like an overhanging entrance. If there's Back a, porch light. a can light or porch light, I can't answer that. But those are okay. also downward facing and not outward projected. Yeah, um, they're all but so, still, so I think the uh, code enforcement officer should know how many of lights are there on this building? Where are the lights located? Because sure. right now, it appears there's absolutely no lights attached to this building, which know, doesn't make sense. We know of two architects that we will meet with and identify those on the okay. plan. I would like to see that so that the code enforcement officer, once again, Great. will have that right there, right in front of them, and because I know there's going to be lightings underneath. Well, that's right. There's a covered yeah. walk that has to be lit. So it's, it's right. lit from a okay. fan light. Again, those are sort of in the building at that point, but where your your point well taken. We'll we'll identify those. Okay, on the building. Yeah, I, I'm not so concerned that that's going to uh, go into the street and that's going to bother the neighbors. Yep. Maybe you could talk to. There is con always concerned about noise, parking, and lighting. Can you talk to what it means for the foot candles to be under a certain, you know, 0.5, and and what effect a 0.5 candle foot light candle would have? If you're across the street in your home, is that going to be right into your, um, you know, living room? Right. So there's there's a couple of issues. There's direct line of sight in mm -hmm. the glare. These are all horizontally mounted with cutoffs that only direct downward. They have no horizontal projection. That would also be true of any lights that are uh, under the um, at the unit entrances. They're basically up in the ceiling, like you would have a can light. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing in this room that is like that. Uh, yeah. But basically, it's like in a residential home where you have a soffit light that's up that lights the walkway for safety so you would not see those unless you're down below the plane for which the light exists yeah. um, you'd have to be under the light you'd have to be you under if you were in you'd have to be within the cone of light that's that's projected here from a distance if you're uh, you know the 25 foot light and you're 100 feet away are you going to see you're probably not going to see the you won't see the bulb you may see that there's light near that but you're not it's not shining in your uh, in your space it's not like a wall sconce it's certainly not like um, most town lighting violate the dark sky standard with the with the globes that shine off in all directions so it's not that type of lighting okay thank you for addressing yep. the lighting so are we satisfied with the landscaping on, on all sides of the building because we kind of left that. Uh, I mean, do you folks I, have I, questions I, or comments? I think we went with option one. I, I'm on sorry, sir. We went with option one. Well, that's option one. Well, well that's just that in the area. Back. <coughs> the hillway, the top of the parking area, the buffer between uh, the two lots. That's everyone's good with that. Yeah, my only other concern was the the landscaping along Hillway, and I was trying to get a mental picture if I was walking down Hillway, what would I see? And I, 
I think I've put it together. I'm not sure what you can do to make it any more clear. But there's the, the three big tree plantings you're doing, there is a raised mound. So it sounds like visually what you'll see is sort of two and a half stories. At least half of the basement level will be cut off visually from the street. Is that correct? Right. And again, this was not prepared for that purpose. It was prepared really to show the straight on building elevation. But when you're in Hillway out here, um, you are you're coming out of patio, you're going down a grade, down to a sidewalk, and you're over in Hillway here. So what you're looking at when you look down Hillway here is this elevation. You do not see this portion of the building, and what you'll see is uh, at least within the right-of-way, you'll see the new uh, locusts that are planted, and then on the property side, you'll see the oaks at the end. So it'll be very residential feeling. Again, further uphill, you're, you won't see a good deal of this building because it's blocked by the existing farmhouse. So. Again, as you go down the street, you're going to see what feels like a, a cadence of residential structures. This is all the buffering between the residential zone and this property, and that is a subjective Pretty, tree, but it's a, it's a little more robust. But the part, part, right, the part on Hillway where you get really close is very prescriptive. That actually is almost a, a menu of what to do with the plazas, the seating, the uh, or the uh, the lower ground cover. And again, that's where we kind of broke it up into the three different types. Well, I think you've done a good job on the, the added plantings. Yeah, this is much darker on the wall than it is even on the screen, so perhaps uh, Maureen can share uh, this, uh, this drive. She'll be able to send it on the PDFs. For some reason, the lighting on the wall is a lot darker than we're seeing on the screen here. Are you all set, Peter? I don't want to cut you off. I, I, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay, while we're back to landscaping, I'm going to bring up fencing. Um, on sheet C504, item J5, that's the detail for your white picket fence. Thank you for adding that. I was very confused, and so thank you for adding the white picket fence. I noticed it did not indicate the height. It did not tell which post cap model you have chosen or the post option you have selected. So I just want to point that out that when you do submit this, it was so uh, sheet C504, yes. J5, white picket fence. Gotcha. I, I didn't see the height, and I didn't see which post cap model or post option you selected. Gotcha. So on the right hand, there's a table on the detail that shows uh, an, uh, a D elevation. Oh, uh, and, and, we've, have the height and we've given you an option of three, 4.24, or five. Uh, right. We've, um, we've given you all the dimensions for the, all four of options for that fence. Just, so. I mean, does the board want to get into the detail on, on the height of this? Can we just ask the applicant mm -hmm. to choose one? And the plan calls the height? Mm -hmm. It just, if nothing's there. So once again, when our code enforcement officer goes out. You bet. And I really don't want to d get into the merits of the height of the post cap they're choosing. Anyone? No. Just, can you just, when you return no. these, no. have that level of detail? Yes. No? Okay. Um, and back to the fencing. Could you show um, the fencing that's going to be in the back, once again, on the Route 77 side, where that fencing is going to be? Well, do you have? Yes, I can show you on the plan, and then again, it's can this. You is, just do a big th picture? This is the feel, and obviously would flank either side. Then there's additional plantings, and those are shown. But the um, not the white picket fence fencing the. Um, the, one the dumpster oh, enclosure. Oh, the dumpster enclosure. No, no not the, the dumpster the, enclosure. The, the walkway the and the dumpster enclosure. Is there fencing that runs along that property line? Right. Can you show that? <laughs> Sorry. Gotcha. Uh, um, what I would. Um, propose out to the board is, once again, we're talking um, sort of like when we were looking at the library. Wait, fencing Wait, this fencing is, is it's going to buffer the, our uh, Cumberland Farms. I'm not sure that. And it sort of reminds me of how when we looked at the library, we ended up not putting a fence between the dentist's office and our library. We just went with plantings. And I want to ask the board, do you want that fence, that screening, for what purpose? And if you could just bring that up. Right. So in your application, the, the, the PVC fence that we have, PVC, it's, the, fence. PVC is the product. It's not a 
PVC slat in a chain link fence. Uh, it's it's a, the material is PVC. Um, it's the same screening fence that we have at the dumpster is also right. one that we have along that right. narrow strip. Again, right. if you could just bring that up. Could you bring up the site plan? Sure. I think so. I have faith. I just brought back the same plan. Yes. Okay. Is it? What page? Yeah, right there. Okay. Oop. Or there. No, back that one. Okay, that one shows the fence a little. Clearer. So there's a PVC. It's called the PVC screen fence along here. Again, I, the discussion with the tree warden and those is that this, although vegetated now, there's no guarantee to remain that way, and so we have a screen there. I believe. I believe a member of the board is suggesting that you may not need that. May not need that. I right. would like to throw it out to the rest of the board, though. It, we now know um, there's going to be a dental office. Probably is going to come for site plan review, a dental office, commercial, right on the other side of that fencing. And I just want to ask the board, do you feel that that fencing is necessary there? Given what we've already, <coughs> projects we've already looked at within the town center and and the screening we've been going with. Can, can I just ask a question? Do you mean that there's going to be a dental office? We, we don't know uh, that there's going to be a dental office right on the other side of the fence. You're just saying in that, on that prog. I'd right. like to think the dental office will follow the town central rules and sit right on the uh, street yeah. as we like to. I'm not sure what will be in that exact corner. Mm -hmm. right. So do we need to put a fence in? I, 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 that's kind of awkward for parking. There may be trees there. Are we fencing off? Yeah. Trees from I, I just I want the board's input on is that fencing necessary in this commercial zone, a commercial property to a commercial property? My opinion is if that st stays vegetated, then I don't think a fence would be necessary. However, we don't I, not knowing what is going to be proposed to be there, uh, the, uh, well, the applicant might want that fence to be there, but I just I don't know. It's kind of tough there? to answer in a vacuum. Oh, no, it's part of the buffering requirements for that side lot. It is um, a buffering requirement? Well, no, I mean, this doesn't say we, we can admit the fence. We can admit the fence. That was added um, based on what were signals we thought we were getting to provide a stronger screen there. And again, we've heard less of that tonight, and it's more about opening and being inviting. And the fence would not create an open or inviting situation. It would block it. Maureen. Okay. I mean, the, the applicant is proposing plantings along that entire area. Yeah. Right. So it's it's not like it's going to be totally stripped. So I just uh, flip would the you like this to I'd like to hear no, back no, from I would say it's board. Not, not necessary because it is commercial to commercial. It's landscaped. Yeah. Plantings. I, I can yeah. I can see pulling. I mean, this uh, this one shows all the plantings along that edge. Views from the, uh, I I support Victoria's uh, opinion. Victoria, you're saying no offense. Or not, I'm, not I'm, uh, I'm just questioning why um, a fence, a very heavy buffering um, to two commercial lots where I don't believe whoever comes in there is going to site their building in that awkward corner. I don't even think they'll be parking there because, once again, it's an ang it's a triangle. How many Are we the single so that that fence is not necessary? I, I'm not sure yeah. why we're buffering. I would, I would say the fence is not necessary. The fence is history. We will eliminate well, the fence. The rest of the board are We will leave the fence other. around the dumpster as required per the standard. We, we'll spend the money somewhere else. <laughs> Maybe we'll put it on an art. Okay. Yes, we'll. <laughs> okay. I'm yes, gonna... well. <laughs> okay. Other items yeah. of interest to the board? Yes, <laughs> yes I do. Um, your entry sign. Um, uh, you, um, could you please describe uh, the new project signs? I don't know the dimensions, the details. Will it be lit? Um, will the townhouses have their own separate sign? I, I couldn't find that level of detail on your um, plan. Did you show? Uh, we show the location of the project sign um, with the details to be determined. I believe it's Right now, we only show a business sign, um, and it's, for lack of a better, it just says sign to show the yeah. representation of where it would be. You probably um, should come back. So you need to see a 
It's in our site plan review. We need to know the sign's dimensions and some details. Yeah. We'll show you the graphics of what might be on the sign. We can probably at least take a well, first stab at what would be there for the business. I'm and sure the graphics will be fine. It, unfortunately, all the we just the need to know the size and the details. And sure. will this sign be lit? Because if it's going to be lit, that'll have to go back into your isometric. And um, will there be a sign for the townhouses? Will there be a separate sign? Because that's not on your plans at all. So uh, if it was an oversight or not an oversight, I just want to just clarify it right mm -hmm. now. Will there be a sign for the townhouse? We don't, we don't have, you know, just we'll a bit of a sign. Just that one project We'll bring it back next point. month. Yep, we'll not provide details month. on moving the Moving on, moving on. So just, yeah, when you submit the plans, your sign just needs yep. that. The lighting manner and the size. If you're going to light it. Yep. But yeah, the dimensions and the details, yes. And lighting of the sign is a concern. Do I, we have to go into your isometric. Yeah. Hey, sorry. Henry has a I question. have just one question, going back to lighting. Um, the orientation of the apartments, are they facing Hill Way or are they facing 77, the living room? Because I guess living rooms have lights at night and that would be much greater source of, elect of light than the light shining down. So I'm just, I couldn't find the orientation of the apartments to which way they were actually facing. Maybe it's in there and I just didn't see it. If, if I could help. Sure, I, oh, sorry. Unless they put in a floodlight and aim it straight outside, there's no way any of that living room light is gonna exceed 0.5 foot candles at the property line. So as long as it doesn't exceed point, point 0.5 foot, <laughs> they're meeting the standard. Then I guess you've answered the question. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. This is probably my last one. So in our um, findings of facts, um, is it true that the applicant is requesting a waiver to the sidewalk along Scott Dyer Road, and should this be noted in our findings of fact? And I'm asking Maureen. Yeah, Maureen um, that. And I thought I had put it in there. And, nope. and again, this is when you step back a step to subdivision review. And in the subdivision ordinance, it explicitly says that you can require a sidewalk on one side of the road. And there's already a sidewalk on the other side of Scott Dyer Road. So you can choose to explicitly say you're waiving it, or you can just approve it without explicitly saying you're waving, waving it because there's only a requirement for one side of the road. Okay. And there's already a sidewalk on one side of the road on Scott Dyer Road. Okay, that answers my question. I don't need to add it to finding the facts unless somebody else it's, wants to add it. It's number three, right? Oh, is it number three? Yeah. Right, the, the what would happen, the, the reality yeah, is that you're proving, you're, asked, you're being asked to prove three lots. <coughs> And the, is it lot three, is the lot that has, it's on the corner of Hillway and Scott Dyer Road in the town center. So anything that someone wants, unless there's really nothing someone can do there without coming to you for site plan review, they have to comply with the town center design standards and at that point you would require the sidewalk. Victoria, all set? All done. Got it, Joe? Good. Um, are we going to look at the building at some point? Um, sure. Oh, I mean. In what way? <laughs> now or never. It's, it's, okay. No, let's, let's Sometimes look at the building. I, I think what's going to happen so, is we're going to give these folks a list of stuff to come back with for the next meeting, at which point the definitive. All right. So I guess my first question for the architects, where are you? Are you? still in working on this or is this a finished design could you uh, sir could you yeah come on up hi i'm i'm will pogar and i'm <coughs> excuse me principal at wbrc in portland and to address your question joseph we are in schematic design phase probably midway through the schematic uh, we're trying to work through some of the <coughs> excuse me again, <clears throat> work through uh, some of the details in terms of its structure and so on and so forth. But uh, really the building plans and building elevations are fairly well fixed if that's a question that you have. All right, well looking at the town center design standards, I just went through them. Um, 
question of scale. Can you bring up the west elevation? <clears throat> and do you have one where it's not uh, faded? Uh, the black and white version, yes. These were to show you the... Actually, that, well, okay. What's that? I was going to say that's fine. Okay, I'll put it back. So I think the elevation on the right is working pretty well. Um, it seems like one of the public speakers point, referred to this as kind of brutal. And you got a lot of wall there, a lot of roof, not a lot of windows in there. And um, at, excuse me, at which level are you? I'm talking about the top level. Top level, okay. Yep. You know, and I think that really, it's in many ways, it's that top level that gives the most character to a building when mm -hmm. you're looking at it from any distance. And um, you know, you mentioned that like the. Live, this building's roughly the size of a library, maybe in, in that vicinity. I think that was mentioned. Well, and the, li the library is here. Yeah. And we are here so by that comparison. Way, okay. So, so we're that, that piece is quite roughly a bit smaller. the size. But I think what makes that library work is that the windows are huge so that the whole building is in scale and I know you can't put those size windows on your building but it seems like there's a lot of little windows in a big expanse of space and that's what so from an energy standpoint we've we've followed the not only the I guess there's a ratio on the building for, for the glazing but we've also looked at from an energy well, standpoint yeah I, I, I would focus on the aesthetic, which I think that you yeah. want to uh, pay attention to. And each of those windows, the double windows there, are egress size windows individually for bedroom, right. one bedroom, so that they are roughly six and a half feet by five feet in dimension. And um, I think that one of, one of the things that could be done is uh, the, what we discovered with the prescriptive measure of the Town Center standard to have the roof hitch be seven and 12 is one of the scale factors that, we, that are out of our uh, out of our possession in terms of modifying, and that uh, be, yes, and so that that's one of the scale elements that we have to obey. We might be able to add a, you know, a <coughs> dormer on top of that to perhaps make the the eave line go up and kind of undulate a little bit in one it's place our, or another. And it's our understanding that we cannot. Uh, receive permission to say do a 512 pitch that it has to be the the the, the standard is very clear that it's 712. That's, so that's a 1212 isn't it? Well they, they, the, the, the main roof? The, the the main roof is not a 1212. The, the, no. the one facing you here is 712. That's 712. Oh, yeah. Okay. So right here this this is uh, 7 to 12 to the ridge and again, another uh, scale reducing feature is the fact that this wasn't taken out as a gable, it was brought down. And, and I just, just to be clear, I think these other elevations, the ones facing 77 in this sky, are fine in terms of addressing the surrounding neighborhood. I think it's mostly this three story piece that's just, it needs some work to either break up the scale or just make it a little friendlier. Okay. Uh, it's my understanding, though, from if you're standing on Hill Way, that the three story is going to be kind of cut off at the basement level, correct? It's going to be down it, below. Street it level. is. In fact, I, I wish that we had thought about this before, and I think when we come back, I'd like to suggest that we add a a dashed line if we could, so that you could understand the grade. Um, it was carried out before, Robert. When you get a chance, I'd like. To well, yeah, I wish. Um, there's no way to annotate this to show well, the line on Hillway that basically goes from here to an intersect down here. Further so down even. It's, it's further even down. further down. So at this point, the hillway grade is at about half to top window height. So what you're really looking at uh, is this part of the building down to about here. You're looking at, uh, 
you know, uh, the other thing I would say is that the, those decks are an important scale reducing factor. They project out in front of the building so that this, looking on in 2D, it doesn't really show you what, how that will render in real life or true scale. So those, it will go, step back in, and then go up, and each of the stories in the residential are exactly what you would find on any house in the adjoining subdivision or most places around Cape Elizabeth. They're only standard residential height. Um, I think, you know, we, I, I, I will discuss this and we'll see if, we, if there's something we can do again. Budget-wise, we have to share to, to I wouldn't say protect the owner, but we have to obey what the owner is able to well, afford. We, so right, we have to meet egress requirements. We have to yeah, meet that. or beat the energy code, which these allow us to do. Every time we put a window in a wall, we basically create a space okay. where heat will escape, what, what, triple glazed um, or not. What, I'm trying to think of some devices that we could use. The, you know. Uh, shutters or something that would that might add um, something to the building break it up in the way well in the way of ornament to the building that would uh, break it up would Perhaps change, it, change in siding color on the third on the no i don't upper I'm half not sure residential. so i guess um, how do we how can we proceed so that at the next meeting we're not looking at seven or eight is there a way to work with maureen and look at Again, this is the subjective part that's very hard to get direction no, from your folks. Well, questions for these folks if they could do uh, it. No, I don't think you're far. I think you just need to apply. I mean, that's why I asked how far along you are, because I think this looks like you're still working through some ideas. And Are you talking about gables along that roof line up there? It's right there? cost. A couple of skylights. No, not so. You're, you're asking the applicant to try. Yeah. Without having any specific instruction. I think and they, the applicant is saying, we'll look at it. I think they want to come back next week, next month, with what they consider to be the final. Or what you'll, right. What we'll bring back, we'll have more detail on the window trim and some other things that may make it look more finished. If I guess what you're looking for is it's not finished. Um, it's a yeah. schematic design, but in, in what I've seen as a non-architect is the more they do, the the more detail it, it does present better. There's just more there to see, to your point. Mm -hmm. So, But again, from a, a basic configuration, um, we like to look in the field, the applicant likes to look in the field, the anticipated energy performance, meeting the code, it's really just a matter now, I think, of embellishing. Um, I don't know if that's, if, if uh, and one thing I measured the windows in the on the bottom I think are five or six feet tall and the, the residential windows are all four feet which is I, I, they shouldn't be if they are then then we will certainly adjust that to my I guess I didn't check that to, to be true to be uh, honest with you but um, they would be uh, I think it would look a little better if they were like four, six, four. Eight. Well, four, you know, you know five feet. You know, uh, can't go below. But. Right, I, I quite agree. And that's that's is a requirement that they would have for egress out of those windows. So if they are at four feet now, then they have to be adjusted downward toward the floor line. We'll double check that, Joseph, and see. Is there an opportunity by which we could share this information and receive input prior to the next? No, formally it has to be done in this I, setting. I mean it. As staff, I'm happy to look at progress stuff and try to provide advice, but in the end, Has I have here. no vote. Understood. So it's it's clearly the decision of the planning board. Yeah. But I, and I we don't want to design it. We will we'll respect your design. Absolutely. We, just to it. We, we would like the design to be pleasing, but we also, as you know, need to obey the limitations of the owner's sure. uh, financial Parameters and uh, we'll, we uh, certainly will give some more thought to it if you're willing to do we, that. Joe, are you all set on building um, issues? Any comments from the side of the lane? I just had one more question on page uh, plan number CD 101. Okay, I'll try here. There's a note on page CD 101, note 2. It says that talks about clearing limits. 
and they can't, they, it says they can't extend beyond what's shown without approval of the project landscape architect. And I would think any clearing that's not shown on the plan would also require approval of the town. If you're talking about clearing areas of the property that are currently vegetated, all of that needs to be shown. You see what pay, I'm a, you see that what a note I'm talking yeah. about. Similar to the notes that we're making about changing the uh, plant specifications, I think you just need to add. And I, I'm sure this is just a construction document, and it's written in construction document language. But for site plan approval purposes, we need to note on this document that the town approval is, would sure. be required. We'll revise it. Yes, that's correct. This is obviously set up for a formal agreement between owner, contractor, and right. with us as a third party. So, um, And that resulted out of the, our conversations with the tree warden to, to show, to reinforce the fact that we're not going to do any clearing in the areas that are shown not to have clearing. We just need to so it wasn't it. to say that, it wasn't like to allow additional clearing. It was to say, hey, hey if it doesn't say clearing, we're not going to be in there, um, to reinforce that point. We'll, so typically that note isn't on the plans at all. It's for just, the for the planning you know, document, we will remove but, without the written approval and just stop it at will not go beyond that shown on this plan. Does that sound? That would and work then, too. And an if it site were, plan. we would have to seek your approval and then grant right. the contract approval. So in a way, this is still valid, yes. but it's just not procedurally satisfying your language for the final approval. I understand. And I have one question about parking. There is a note in our memo from the, the town that says there is no shared parking. But as I understand your parking calculations, in fact, you are counting on some shared parking. Is that not correct? Correct. Um, the shared you're, parking you're like is... Three spaces short? Um, on, on lot two, on, on lot one, 50 spaces are required. And we're providing 51 overall spaces right. for lot one. For lot two, um, a, a two, um, you know, the, the, the two dwelling units uh, requires four spaces. So there's one space on lot two. And the, there are 14 spaces shown on lot two that are shared by both lots. So lots there is shared parking? It is, right. Okay. Now. Not, because the, the, our, our, our planning board memorandum said there is not shared parking, and my understanding is that there is. It probably works, but I just think we need to be clear that we are counting on some shared parking. Does someone need to move yeah. from this space to allow someone else to use it, John, or is it shared only in the sense that it crosses the line and it's meeting your... You guys can work it out. Right? Yeah, is that... Yeah. yeah. We just need to yeah. clarify that. Okay, is that it, Lane, on your... Sorry, are you talking to me? Oh, I'm talking to... Are you all set? I'm all set. Henry, Caroline, yeah. you good? Yep. <coughs> okay, so I think we'll... <coughs> <make sure. coughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. That you uh, have a list of what you'll be working on for the May meeting, and if I'm remembering things correctly on landscaping, you'll revise the plans to Absolutely. build in option one anything else if you would just give a second look at the screening on hillway to see if anything else is in light of the comments would be useful remove the fence uh, you have notes in victoria's uh, several questions on the lighting plan is that light light and sign okay. and joe's question about the roof line of the uh, the main building as far as the building goes there's a lot to discuss about the building I mean, they, they're still in their design phase. There's the question of what kind of siding they're going to be using. So they're, the building probably will be the key topic of discussion right. at the next meeting. Is there anything that you've seen so far, though, that you want to require? I mean, no, address? I just, I, I don't, I think Joe hit on it. The building design is not complete, so we haven't really seen the and is it building. atypical that for site plan review, the building design is usually not complete? Most folks wouldn't go all the way through a building design unless they knew they had secured the right to build the building and spend that. So at what point 
I guess what level of detail? It seems like we're almost there. So we need to provide a little more detail on the elevation specific to the town and center <laughs> standard that talks about the appeal of the building. And you've, you've, the only thing I would be a little concerned about is you've talked about reserving the right to use either wood shingles or a composite. And I know you've got labels on the plan. I think we just want to look at those labels and make sure it's really clear what exterior materials and that you know we you, you say that it's either a or b and there's a key that's a sure. or b and but i don't i mean i think those are the things we're talking about okay is that fair yes that is okay fair. and there were no questions i mean we, we had a fairly extensive table that went around the building perimeter to calculate building height and volume i mean those are the things that if if there's a dispute on that which again it we, we went to great lengths to make sure that it was pretty airtight the uh the analysis of that that would really change things for us the what you're talking about are things that are supplemental to provide you with more info not to change the overall yes great in, in anticipation of a tabling motion that you'll be making i just wanted to point out that um, the submission deadline for the may meeting is this friday <laughs> you may not be able to make that because the april meeting's been slid forward a whole week and that I would suggest that we let the applicant have an extra day or two and that I will work directly with them to make sure that happens. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> agree. Definitely. Okay. Um, I guess I would then ask for a motion to table to the May meeting. Mm -hmm. Do we have a text for that? No. I'll make it. You should. Do have a trick somewhere? <coughs> Page. Yeah. Keep going. There's a motion for approval on page 11. 10 that yeah. could, excuse me, on page 11, there, at the top of page 11, there's a motion for approval that could very easily be converted into a motion to table to the May 17th meeting. Joe, Joe's got it under control. Joe, would you oh, like no. to? Uh, yeah, do I need to read that be it ordered and all that? <laughs> yep, yeah. I think it's just the table. Just, to just the page. motion at the very top. Be it ordered that be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented the application of two penguin properties LLC for minor subdivision review of a three lot subdivision and site plan review of two buildings containing 6,205 square feet of medical office space 10 multifamily residential units and a 357 square foot building connector located at 12 Hill Way be tabled until the meeting at May 7th. May, 7th. May 17th, 2016. Second. Okay, we have a motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And I will leave the uh, USB drive Thank in you your much. machine so I don't disconnect it improperly. <laughs> Okay, we, uh, if, if the folks who are going to leave could do so quickly and quietly, we do have another uh, application to consider. Um, let's see. Sure, I'm going to be leaving you. I'm leaving. This one's like password protected. That's right.
Okay, that's after you have 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay, uh, for the board, a, to, we have a rule that says we have to approve extending beyond 10 o'clock. And since the folks from Verizon have been sitting here patiently, uh, do I have a motion to amend the rules to extend past 10 o'clock? I'll make it. Okay, second. Jonathan, uh, all in favor? Okay. Ask unanimously. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thank the folks from Verizon for your patience. Uh, it's been a long night, I realize. Okay, the next uh, agenda item is, excuse me, uh, Verizon Wireless is requesting site plan review to install wireless antennas on the existing water tower located at 11 Avon Road and construct a 10 by 16 foot concrete pad at the base of the tower to support equipment cabinets and a generator. Um, the application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations. The procedure on this hearing will be as follows. We'll ask the applicant to summarize changes to last month's um, project submission. Oh, okay. We will then uh, have a allow a period for public comment. <coughs> the um, planning board rules permit the uh, board to limit public comment at this point to a total of 15 minutes with a maximum of three minutes per speaker. And we will um, we will use that, that guideline, so we'll have 15 minutes for public comment. Uh, all those who wish to speak who can be accommodated will be accommodated, but it's a zero-sum game. So if you use your entire three minutes uh, but could really say it in two, you've taken a minute from somebody else. So I would ask you to be concise. Uh, at the close of the public comment, we'll begin discussion, and at the end of the discussion, we have the option to approve, approve the conditions, table, or deny the application. Um, we'd like to hear from the applicant about changes uh, since last month. Super great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Scott Anderson and Chip Fredette here for Verizon Wireless. Um, let me just get right to some of the changes we had submitted on April 1st. Um, uh, kind of a cover letter walking through them, and I can kind of walk folks through on the big screen here um, of some of the changes that we have um, added. I'm going to take them kind of in order of as they show up in the site plan. Um, we had had a discussion at the last meeting um, about uh, kind of both a buffering and an access management issue to the site. Um, as I think everybody knows, this kind of area is surrounded by an existing chain link fence. And um, currently, there's a somewhat undefined parking area that comes all through here. Um, there was a kind of request to try to narrow up the um, entrance of the driveway to 24 feet, which we had done. Uh, but also still to provide enough room for kind of backing in and, 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 and you know, vehicle uh, circulation inside. Again, the, the site for our part will be visited about once a month by a Verizon wireless technician. So the one um, change that we had done was to tighten this up to 24 feet um, and to provide some grass and vegetation in that area. And then also to provide um, um, some additional vegetation in this area given that we've got significant vegetation around the kind of three sides of the site, but not as much here in the front. Um, so we had proposed to put some over here. We kind of moved things over somewhat um, consistent with, um, I think it was Joe's um, kind of schematic that he had done and tried to kind of pick up on that and, and provide some additional buffering here. Um, we understand that Maureen has kind of taken a crack at this. We reviewed her memo um, and some of her th uh, thoughts. Um, you know, we had proposed a, a split rail fence here. Um, if a kind of a, a mulch area would be preferable, we're fine with that. Um, I, I took a quick look, well, not a quick look because we had some time. I took an extensive look at her um, um, kind of modification, which we're comfortable with. I, I'm, I'm getting the sense from her two things. One, um, some interest in putting some buffering over here and a slight realignment of where we've uh, proposed to put the trees, maybe fewer over here and more in this immediate area which uh, works for us and we're willing to work with the board on that. 
um, and also some concerns that Maureen had in checking with others about the types of trees that we're proposing, uh, preference uh, for kind of local hemlock as opposed to the eastern red cedar and some of the fruit trees that we had suggested. Those are also uh, changes that we're completely comfortable with um, taking some direction from the board. <clears throat> the um, two other, uh, and these will be extraordinarily difficult for you to see, but um, in the hard copies that you've had, we've made changes to two of the notes on the plan, one dealing with co-location and one dealing with lead remediation. With regard to co-location, there was a concern um, by, I think it was Elaine and maybe some of the other board members to make it clear that not only are we going to comply with the FCC's rules and requirements regarding co-location, which is kind of part of our FCC license, but specifically that we will, of course, be complying with the town's co-location provision in your ordinance. So we modified um, note six on C1 um, to make it clear that um, we are subject both to our FCC obligations and the town's obligations for co-location. We also added um, a kind of a, a sentence there. Obviously, anybody that comes on the site after us has to reach an agreement with the Portland Water District, and we just wanted to clarify that as well. Um, the second note change we made had to do with the lead remediation. That's note seven on sheet C1. And there's really two things that we did with that. First, we wanted to expressly reference the January 7th, 2015 letter from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection that kind of laid out what the obligation was for the water district's lead remediation work, which includes both what they've done now and then um, follow up after the tank has been painted. I think we've talked about kind of how this will go. The, the, the tank will be repainted by the water district. We pay um, a percentage of that. Um, and then after the painting is done, then the DEP requires the PWD to, to make sure that there hasn't been any additional lead contamination of the soil as a result of the prepping of the tank and the painting. Um, and um, Verizon Wireless will not come onto the site to do any work until the painting is done and the DEP is signed off. So we uh, made sure we expressly reference that January 7th letter. And we also made it clear that we are, would, would obviously comply with any requirements imposed on us directly by the DEP as part of our site mobilization and installation of our equipment. So um, trying to make sure that no matter what the DEP says to whoever they say it to, that we will be subject to those rules and, and will follow whatever instructions um, they've given um, to the, the water district and, and, if, and if necessary to us. Um, the next change um, is um, I think best seen on C2. So the original proposal had three side uh, of the wood stockade fencing that we were proposing and we were proposing the piggyback on the existing chain link fence of the water district. Um, there was um, a kind of question and, and a request by some of the planning board um, to kind of further attenuate the sound as much as, as possible. So what we've done is we've added a fourth section of fencing there. So there will be wood stockade fencing that will surround the equipment uh, uh, enclosure completely. And then we have proposed to put the sound attenuating fabric, which goes on the inside of the fence, which will further reduce the sound um, even at the closest property line, which is right here. So based on our kind of discussions with our sound guy after we explained to him the changes that we were proposing here, um, even if the board were to decide that the emergency generator running in emergency mode, which means it could, excuse me, it could be happening during evening hours, we will be below 45 dBA at the property line, even with the, with the emergency generator running um, in the middle of the night. Um, um, we, we still think that the, that the way your ordinance is structured, that if the town of Cape Elizabeth loses power, you know, I'm not sure what percentage of homes have backup generators, but we expect those all come on. We do have a battery backup. One of those boxes is the battery backup. It's good for six to eight hours. So it's not until six to eight hours have gone that our emergency generator would even come on. But um, with the additional fence and the sound attenuation, it, it sort of takes the legal question of whether the emergency generator is subject to your sound standard somewhat off the table. Um, um, also kind of not shown on the plan, um, we were asked to provide specific um, amounts for the town to calculate a performance guarantee. Um, and there were two items that we submitted estimates for. One was for the planting and improvements 
and the second was for removal of the antennas and the equipment area in the event that the site was abandoned. Uh, we would expect that uh, a condition of any approval would require us to essentially take everything down and disassemble it following some period of non-use and then the performance guarantee is there and in the event that we don't show up and do it so that you can do it. So we provided estimates from our engineers both on the cost of the planting and the cost of uh, removal. Um, in the event that we are doing a modification to the planting plan per Maureen's kind of mock-up, uh, we would uh, propose to make sure that the amount that we've given for the planting costs would be adjusted. It, it may not need to be, but we would propose that you know that be kind of redone um, before a building permit was issued and before anything constructed to make sure that any change in the planting plan would still be covered by the performance guarantee. Um, finally, we did, and I'm sorry I don't have uh, plots for these uh, uh, for the big screen, but <clears throat> a question had come up from some members of the public about what the coverage uh, change would be expected from the site. So I, I believe it's the last tab of the submittal on April 1st. We asked our RF engineers to do a kind of before and after, which, sh which shows the kind of what we would consider to be inadequate coverage at this point in time in this kind of corner of Cape Elizabeth and what the expected footprint would be of the antennas at this elevation um, were they installed and, and turned on uh, to kind of address those coverage um, um, uh, improvements that, that we're, we're searching with here. And I think we talked about how it, whether or not that was part of the planning board process, it was a question that many people had asked. So we wanted to make sure that you had that information. Um, and then the only other one thing that I would talk about kind of briefly, just because there's been a lot of um, kind of comment on it, um, we have this issue of concealment, which I think the board did talk about as kind of their threshold issue last week. Um, you certainly have got plenty of legal views. I think there's actually a pretty straightforward way in which your ordinance flows. Um, we have a situation where installation of antennas on alternative tower structures need to be concealed and that's reflected in the kind of list of land uses for each one of the of the zoning districts you also have the provision which is kind of the permitting flow chart which is under what circumstances um, could the code officer issue a permit and what circumstances does a planning board need to do the review i think the way you read all of these together and I appreciate why looking at them initially, it, it can cause some confusion. But the, the zoning talks about concealment, but doesn't talk about complete or incomplete concealment. The permitting kind of plan talks about, I think, permanent, uh, you know, complete and, and incomplete. So in the event, we keep using the example of a church steeple. If you were able to do an installation where the antennas were completely hidden and you wouldn't even be able to see them, well, I think that fits the CEO permit. That's complete concealment and then Ben can issue a permit for that and that project wouldn't necessarily come before the board. In the event that concealment is not complete, that's when it comes to the planning board for site plan review. And I think that reflects the idea that folks have put the ordinance together that, look, if you can't see anything, it's okay, you can do a building permit and, and the CEO can handle that. But if there are things that are visible in any way on the outside, then it comes to you for site plan review. So. Um, I think that was a discussion that we had had and the board had kind of gotten into that as a threshold issue last um, time. We can certainly answer you know, any questions that you might have uh, about that. But I just wanted to run through kind of briefly. Um, we, it had come up a couple of times about can you show us some other water tank installations and we had talked about that, some of the butters. And so what I put up here is just some, th these are our kind of standard water tank installations. None of these are concealed in any way. And you can see, you know, here you've got multiple carriers. You've got one here, you've got one here, and one here. Uh, this one, I think, is in Kittery. No, it's Freeport. Freeport, sorry. And so this is New Market, New Hampshire. Again, the, the antennas are kind of there. They're, co they're colored to paint to match the, the tank, but none of them are concealed. Um, Salem, New Hampshire, with three different carriers on right there. And just for time, I'm kind of zipping through these. This is up in Bangor, obviously next to the airport, which is why it looks like the Purian, a dog chow person. But uh, same idea, we've got different levels for different carriers, but not, not really any sense of concealment. Sometimes they get painted, um, just kind of scrolling down. Um, this is kind of the normal industry installation um, for antennas. Um, and and I, I'm not, I probably won't even pull it up, but just because I know you've seen the photo simulations that we've provided for here um, that, that show what we've attempted to do um, with um, the 
right now that I've said that, I'm going to bring it up just so that everybody can see what we propose. So um, both the, the kind of before and after, this one showing the after, uh, we're proposing the, the shrouds uh, for the antennas. I know there, there was some discussion both at the site walk and subsequently by some of the abutters about the possibility of running the shrouds the entirety around um, the water tank. Um, this may get into kind of a subjective area. Our goal has always been to do the best that we can to conceal the presence of the antennas such that if a year from now, if this site were to be built, someone who never had no idea what we had been doing here all this time came and looked up at this tank, they would see a, a water tank with some things attached but wouldn't necessarily see it as a cell phone facility, which is we think what the kind of purposes of the concealment to cover the antennas most people know what cell phone antennas are so um, that's been our goal is to do that uh, as required by the zoning ordinance um, i think what we've indicated before is we think that this is the best option because it conceals the antennas we think completely for purposes of the antennas um, but doesn't add any unnecessary mass to the top of the tank um, running the shroud the entirety around uh, would require a lot of additional material that would just be covering the existing railing system. Um, and as a result, we think that this is actually the, the best, most visually minimally intrusive way to kind of shield what this is um, and conceal the antennas, but also kind of minimize visual impacts as much as possible. Um, I, I think the only other picture I'll leave you with was one that, um, that um, Mr. Armstrong had sent, which I thought Let's see if this works. We didn't actually have one of these. Mr. Armstrong had done kind of a rendering of what would the painted tank look like if our antennas were not on it. This is, I think, is actually helpful because our simulation showed the rusted tank, so there was a lot of change. But I think what we're hoping the board sees from these two and what the, that the abutters kind of appreciate is based on kind of what's there now when it gets repainted, that the addition that we have to the top is actually quite minimal, which really reflects what our approach has been since the beginning with this project, which is to try to design something that will address a significant coverage gap to improve cell phone service in Cape Elizabeth, but to do it using a structure that's already here and to do it in the most visually minimally intrusive way possible. So um, working with you folks on the planting plan, eliminating the equipment shelter, going with the smaller cabinets, moving that to the, to the back of the tank, um, these are things that we've tried to do to make this a kind of a, a, a positive site that provides significant benefits um, while still minimizing the impacts to um, abutters and the like. So um, that's probably all our kind of new, what's new and in response and we're here for questions or Quick question. comments. Sure. Whatever's the uh, hemlocks, the six to seven foot hemlocks, how tall would they ultimately get? Can you go back to that picture? Yes. Good question. I've, I've seen hemlocks get into the high teens. So that is a... So that would be about two and a half times the fence height. Yeah, so maybe here. I'll look it up. Peter Weller. Yeah, John. I, I don't know if we've ever asked this, but is the top of the tower also going to be painted the same color? Yes. Okay. The, do the, the dome. The dome, yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess we haven't seen it. Okay. Um, to keep this moving along, I'd like to turn to the 15-minute public um, comment period. Uh, once again, if you folks wouldn't mind lining up the... Uh, they were already lined up. I've looked, I've looked up your answer to your question. Um, Arbor Day, Canadian hemlock grows to a height of 40 to 70 feet and a spread of 20 to 35 feet at maturity. Awesome. The, uh, okay, Maureen will be running the three minute timer and. Give me a second. Yep. As soon as she. Okay. Good. Okay. Yes, sir. If you identify yourself and, and have it. Uh, thank you, members of the board. Chairman Curry. As you know, my name is Pavel Darling. I live at 9 Avon Road, directly abutting uh, 11 Avon Road in the water tank. Um, it, I know it's late, uh, but the first thing I want to do is thank you all for your time. Um, as it relates to the Verizon proposal, we've come a ways uh, since we first started this, and, and I really do appreciate all of the effort that you have done. Um, I know that you all want to get home, as, I, as, I, as do I, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, 
my comments are more to introduce topics that the, my neighbors below behind me will um, be bringing forward. But really, I think there are three requirements that have still yet to be, meet, to be met uh, by Verizon. The first is a very simple one. There's a fence. It is not currently eight feet tall. We have not heard or seen anything in the application yet <coughs> that indicates that that's going to be dealt with in any way. I know we've discussed it, but it's still not there. Second, uh, the current buffering plan does not extend throughout the property. I know Attorney Anderson has said that there's vegetation around it. As you'll hear from our neighbors and see from some pictures, we would disagree with that statement and do think that buffering should extend all around the property, in particular for the abutting properties. And lastly, the issue of concealment. We don't feel that the current application proposal does meet the concealment standard that is before you. I'll note that you've received uh, written comments from our attorneys at Brandon Isaacson. Uh, our attorney, Nat, is here. If you have any questions as it relates to the legal issues, I am not an attorney. I'll leave that to the lawyers to, to, uh, to handle. But I do believe concealment is a standard that, that you need to meet, uh, and we don't believe that it currently has been met. Lastly, I'll just note that I did submit some written comments. I think they're fairly straightforward, so in the interest of time, I'll just let you refer to those written comments. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Todd Forsyth. I live at 13 Trundy Road. Uh, I am going to try to bring this up if I can. Uh, this works much better if I have some photos. Uh, so I have two specific concerns that I'm going to speak with this evening, and uh, both were uh, raised by Pavel a minute ago there. Uh, concern one is a visual buffering on the non-Avon roadside to the back side, uh, where uh, there are three, four abutters uh, to the piece of property. Uh, the proposed site does not meet the town ordinance uh, requirements, uh, specifically the uh, zoning ordinance, unless existing vegetation provides a buffer strip, a vegetated buffer shall be provided along property lines, along roadways, or visible to existing abutted or nearby buildings within a quarter mile to be landscaped as follows, blah, blah, blah. So I want to show you um, in, in the memos that, that Verizon has continues to show and the, the maps that they show. Actually, earlier you saw this visual which from the appearance would appear that there's a lush green forest surrounding uh, the property behind when in fact what the property really does look like if you look at from my home and my neighbor's home so this is this is a visual from my neighbor's house you can see that this is six to seven months of the year where there is no growth or very little vegetation uh, there is a canopy obviously in the summertime but there's no undergrowth so the visual that we have is at eye level um, and from my home would be very similar. This is from my, my backyard, so this is my property looking across. Uh, so there is no vegetation, so there is not a vegetation buffer, right? So you can, uh, so Verizon is required to comply with the buffering requirements clearly, uh, clearly outlined in the tower. Uh, uh, in the town ordinance and while they may are, and, and actually it's interesting because we've now heard that uh, hemlock is uh, is a possibility as vegetation and, and hemlock is actually shade tolerant uh, grows to 10 15 feet uh, is grows very quickly and is actually used in Maine as a visual barrier uh, for these types of, of issues so um, something the other second concern that I have is actually the height of the fence so as Pavel raised earlier uh, the, the, the fence, and I'll just throw a couple of these. This is an actual, you can see here, the fence is uh, under, se under seven feet all the way around the, at the tower. It, there's no place that it actually hits seven feet. The, the height of this board is actually, or the, the piece of wood that I'm using is cut to eight feet. So this has been raised a number of times and nowhere has uh, Verizon addressed it. So proposed solution, it is uh, the request of those individuals whose homes abut the, uh, the proposed site that the existing fence be replaced by an eight foot fence that includes, a green, that includes green privacy slats uh, on the rear three sides of, this, of the site. Uh, it is agreed among the group that an eight foot fence with privacy slats along with a buffer of hemlock trees surrounding the three non-Avon roadsides of the site would meet requirements. You've run out of time. Thank you. Good evening, Brad Kaufman, 1 Avon Road. 
This is a picture of a water tank in Watauga, Texas, that actually conceals the presence of cellular antennas as our ordinance requires. This concealment band is what provides the stealth characteristics of this tower. In this inset picture, you can actually see with some of the panels removed where the cellular antennas are. This design was done by a company Stealth Concealment Solutions. I asked them to provide suggestions for the Avon Road Tower. This is the first option that they provided on the right where the concealment band would go around the perimeter of the catwalk. There you can see where it would be located. The second option that they provided would actually tuck the concealment band under the catwalk as you see there. The point of these examples is to show you, I, Mr. Anderson showed you a parade of horribles. I want to show you what concealing the presence actually looks like. And these examples, I think, demonstrate the difference between concealing the presence of antennas and merely screening them. The ordinance allows screening of things like dumpsters and storage sheds, but not commercial antennas on alternative tower structures. Verizon can, as you can see from these examples, Verizon can, and it must conceal the presence of its proposed antennas. Thank you. Thank you. Priscilla Armstrong, 18 Avon Road. The water tower site has in the past been twice considered a possibility for a tower overlay district and twice rejected. Although the neighbors on Trendy and Avon Road thought this question had been put to rest in 2014, 2004, sorry, we also took comfort in the wording of the town zoning ordinance language for alternative tower sites because the language specifically required that the presence of any antenna are required to be concealed, not camouflaged. In fact, those two words were debated back and forth um, when the ordinances were being drawn up and concealed one out. I was going to talk about the buffering um, because what was on the plan would not work. Hemlock wood, my woods are full of it. If, if you went that way, I'm sure, and, they, and Maureen is right, they grow to 25 to 35 feet at maturity. You know, a spread of, and so they, they would work anyhow. <laughs> But my real point is that while I feel that Verizon has made some changes to their original proposal and that some of the changes have resulted in a better plan, these changes really, I feel, have resulted because of extreme involvement and in research for better ways to do this by the neighbors and not because Verizon really wanted to provide the building that would have the least negative impact on the neighborhood. I regret that Verizon chose to sue the town when the Zoning Board of Appeals turned down their application instead of working with the town. But regardless of how this came out as a result of the lawsuit, Verizon did have to go through site approval and with you, the planning board, and it does have to meet the town ordinances regarding concealment and buffering. Please consider carefully and ask yourself if Verizon has fully met them. If you don't feel that they have, please don't issue a permit. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. Tim Carter, 28 Broad Cove Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, you've heard a number of reasonable requests, I think. Um, I have two stories for you, one hypothetical and one actual. The first hypothetical is that I, we moved here not long ago. I have a dog, I'm elderly, um, I use the Greenbelt trails in the Broad Cove area. If I fall and break my ankle or something worse, I cannot call 911. I will lie there until somebody happens to hear me call for help. Actual number two, uh, about a week ago, uh, my wife and I were awakened in the early hours of the morning by um, our carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide alarm, okay? It did wake us up. I went to turn on the light. Uh, the lights were out. We had no power. I threw open the windows, grabbed a coat, ran outside my sock feet, wondering how I was going to call 911 because we have no service. I had invested, I knew this, I had invested in a uh, power, in a, a signal amplifier, 
uh, from my home, and it covers my home and yard, and so I can use the cell phone. When the power's out, that's out. And so it turned out that the carbon monoxide issue was resolved because I drove in my stocking feet over to find the fire chief who was over at the accident, uh, and he called his people, and they came over, and they helped us with it. Right? If it, instead of being a carbon monoxide problem, it had been a heart attack or a stroke, I would, not, I would be dead now without the cell phone service. So while we're dealing with all of these niceties, and which are important in terms of aesthetics, um, there's a possibility that someone will lose their life because there is no cell phone service. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. OK, this will be the last uh, speaker. Uh, good evening, Tony Armstrong, 32 Lawson Road. I first want to just briefly address a sort of a side issue. I got a sense at the last meeting that there was some concern that if a cell phone company doesn't come in here and help the water district pay to paint this tank, that you're going to be looking at this ugly rust, rust bucket, as was properly said last week, forever. And I just want to make it clear that the record is very clear that the Water District had plans to take this tank down. They told us this in 2013. I've done a four-year request. There's documentation in the Water District files showing they've got studies to this effect. They've explained timelines to other people about what they were going to do. So the bottom, and given the fact that you've got this major contamination issue with the DEP looking over their shoulder, I can assure you it's very unlikely that if the cell phone companies are not allowed to come into this situation, it is very unlikely that tank will continue to sit there the way it is. Either it's coming down or it's going to get, as Mr. Anderson properly showed you, it's going to be painted and look like that. So that, I want to deal with that issue. The other issue I want to focus on is concealment. You know, as an attorney, I understand, and I'm going to openly simplify this, the analysis of legislation when there's not uh, a clear understanding where things are at usually starts out with plain meaning of the language. Everybody has spoken to the plain meaning here. Everybody's agreed that this, this, uh, the uh, proposal has failed to conceal the presence of, uh, 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 of an antenna. Mr. Anderson basically said that uh, la at the last meeting. Uh, so then you start to look, as I have, uh, at the legislative history of this endeavor. Uh, we had the Telecommunications Committee Task Force in the late 90s followed up by the planning board, followed up by the council. And if you look at the email I sent you this week, and I hope you do, you'll see that in each event, something was done to make this language that ultimately ended up in the ordinance very specific that concealment and conceal was to be used over the term uh, camouflage. Uh, secondly, that uh, uh, in situations where uh, camouflage was being used, uh, the, the effort would be to put the uh, antennas in or within the tower, including the alternative tower structure. And there's a letter from the town attorney to the planning staff saying that the language should be tightened up. And in the end, when it got to the council for the final decision, the language was amended by a proposal by Councillor Swift Kayata in which she wanted the language tightened up so it was pretty clear that uh, the two primary places to put antennas in this town would be at the locations of the tower overlay zones, the other two places. And I'll segue into the final point here, which is that not once, but twice, and maybe even a third time, the tower overlay zone was rejected on the Avon Road site because it is such a tight site and close, so close to residences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Markman. Okay, with that, we will close the public comment period. <coughs> and the word is, uh, we can now discuss the uh, <coughs> merits of the application. I guess it probably makes sense to identify what no longer is an issue and what's Still is an issue, and an <coughs> issue, and uh, I'm in support of many of the comments. We talked a lot about the height of the fence in the last two meetings, and I'm just was perplexed why I wasn't seeing a replacement of the fence on the plan. Well, I think our proposed finding we have a requirement for the fence. I do. I, I I I'm curious why it didn't show up on the plan. 
Yeah, and I, and I thought that we had made it clear at the last meeting that we would agree in any location that the fence, because some of it's closer than others, maybe to eight feet, but that we would agree to make sure that that fence was eight feet at all locations. We didn't put a change to the plan to that effect. I thought that was going to be a condition of approval, and we're still totally fine with making sure that that is eight feet at every location. I, I don't think we need to. Um, replace the entire fence, but just to make sure that to the extent it is sagging or bent or out of whack, that it is repaired and is eight feet at every point um, around the perimeter of the, of the tower. Okay. Yeah, I think they might have a hard time doing that well, because of the height of the fence, making it eight feet all the way around. Okay. One way or another, they would have to... Uh, it will be eight feet all the way around. In the end, okay. That's all. The earlier discussions we had had regarding the noise, uh, I heard no comments. Uh, I think they've addressed. I think they have. Yeah. yeah. So I think the noise is off the table, as a, unless anybody disagrees. Okay. Um, well, why don't we talk about um, concealment? Concealment. <laughs> uh, any. Any observations by, by the other board members on the point? Henry. I looked at the uh, photograph that was on the screen with the shroud going all the way around. And whilst I hear what Verizon have to say about minimalizing it, I must admit that the photograph with the shroud going all the way around certainly looked, in my estimation, a lot better than three things around the place, wherever they are. So from my vote, I would rather see the shroud going all the way around. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. I know you're going to find this shocking. I agree with Henry. Wow. Gee, that's the first time, right? <laughs> uh, let, me, let me take the other side of that. Um, I, I suppose you could say that the shroud going all the way around is a little more attractive. Um, it looks like it's part of the prettier, part of the but design. on the specific issue of concealment, all the shroud going all the way around is doing is concealing other areas where there is not an antenna. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I find one more attractive than the other, but I think in, in each case, the the shroud is concealing the antenna structure. And in each case, when you look at this thing, whether it's three separate boxes or a thing the collar going all the way around, uh, but you see the, the, the wires going up. You, you know the antennas there, you, just don't, you don't happen to know where they are. I don't know whether you'd actually know there are antennas there unless you've been to one of these meetings and seen what the shrouds are. Well, you normally don't have shrouds around a, a tower, I don't think. Anyway, that's wow. my, own, my own feeling that uh, there are two different ways to do it. I, I find the the, the selection they've made of a shroud on the antenna itself, covering it completely to satisfy the requirement. Acknowledging fully there are other ways to do it and you may find the other way more attractive. Views down here. Uh, my view with regards to that is that the, the smaller um, does satisfy, and this is just my opinion, the concealment aspect. Um, I think of it as if you add a larger structure to something, there's a larger structure up there. And that's what a shroud that would go 360 degrees around the uh, water tower uh, would show. I, I feel that if you, if when you're driving on Wells Road and you look at the horizon, you can see the water tower. I think if it had a 360 degree shroud around it, it would be stick out much more than it would if it had just the small three um, shrouds on it. So my opinion is that um, the shroud would add a little too much that all of a sudden uh, the whole aspect of concealing these three antennas would make the entire thing um, stand out a little bit more and therefore we lost the whole aspect of concealment. So we have two votes in each direction, Joe so, and Elaine. <laughs> yeah, if it were in my backyard, I would actually prefer the discontinuous, uh, just the three little pieces. I mean, I. I'm an architect. I like industrial-looking things. The, the continuous shroud just seems gratuitous and kind of, I don't know, odd to me. Whereas 
I like being able to see the uh, railing on the, at the top there. So, Elaine, how do you feel? I think the three separate shrouds, as they're shown, meet the requirements of the ordinance for concealment. Okay, so as we go forward, I think we're looking at four votes that the existing shrouds are okay and two not. I guess so. <clears throat> okay. Um, we got the eight feet, we got the shrouds um, buffering. The number of the commenters believe that the, uh, the plantings to achieve buffering should be not only where they are on Avon Road, but down the sides and the back facing Trundy. Do we have any observations on that one? This is on the buffering. What do you mean? This is the, the buffering? Yeah. Um, when Are we talking about the actual front portion of it or the buffering I think around every, the back? I think everything else. Uh, well, photos we saw, you didn't seem to be able to see the top. So I'm not sure what it's, the additional buffering would be changing. I mean, the view of that is going to remain as it is. The view of the, well, your photo she didn't show the top. Your photo is just this part. That's there. There's no reason to buffer it. OK, we, 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 this has to be a conversation by the board. I'm sorry, sir. We can't, can't invite you to talk further. Uh, I have one question about the buffering. Um, it isn't Verizon's site. <laughs> So I assume that the, w, the water department or the water owners of the property wouldn't mind you doing all these changes to the site. I mean, it's all very well to put trees in there, but as you don't own the site, I assume somehow you have permission to actually do this. Well, there's some provisions in the lease that allow, that kind of require the Portland Water District to allow for kind of reasonable conditions imposed by the board. So the planting that we've proposed in the front, I don't think there's any question that, that that will be fine with them and that they'll see that as kind of part of the process of working with the town. I mean, I think our concern with going around the entirety of the site is not only, I mean, we want to keep the fence in roughly the place it's in right now, which topographically on the back, you may have remembered from the site walk, is kind of right on the edge of where the slope starts to go. So um, there's the issue about are we putting hemlock trees that are 15 feet to block the bottom of the tank? We're, we're, we're totally working with, I think, the town to do the buffering in front where the road is, but I keep going back to, you know, the tank is there. We're trying to minimize kind of the visual impacts at the base, but we, we won't be able to do anything to prevent the people on Trundy Road from seeing the tank. It's just simply too big. So we've been focusing on kind of the, the view from the road where our equipment, our installation is, and we think that makes sense. And we've got uh, logistical and then issues about, you know, whether or not it is necessary to do new plantings. Um, you know, we, there, there is quite a bit of vegetation in the back, which we think complies with the ordinance. So, yeah, my own <coughs> observation is that the, um, the folks down in Trundy, and I, I appreciate your not caring to have this monstrosity in your backyard, <coughs> pardon me, but you're about, if I read the topo map correctly, you're about 15 feet or more below the grade of where the water tank tower sits. So you are looking up the slope, to, if you want if, to see the tower, looking straight ahead, you're looking sort of the hillside. And to put plantings back there, you'd have to cut down existing trees, which is something we don't like to do, trees which are shielding your view for you know, a significant part of the year. Um, and there's still no way you're going to obscure, if, if you put in some kind of hemlocks there, you're still going to see the top two thirds of the tower. There, there's really no way you can, you can shield that tower from your view. Um, so I, my own reaction was, as much as you may not care for that thing, the existing forestation that is there is adequate buffering, and to, to change it and put in evergreens back there, you would have to 
eliminate a lot of the existing trees, which is seems counterproductive. Um, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I mean, from the site walk, which I'm grateful that a lot of the people in the neighborhood came out for, um, we had a hard time getting around the perimeter of that barbed wire fence because it was some thick brush that was back there. And from what I saw also, I, I think uh, Mr. Anderson was correct that there was sort of slope down, which would make it harder to bring in buffering. And as Peter just pointed out, I think you'd probably take away more buffering just to put buffering in. I know that doesn't make sense, but there's already something natural in there that I think it would be counterproductive to actually go back there with machinery, put in, um, put in new trees to create some sort of buffering. And also from what I saw too is that there was a, quite a bit of distance between um, the property lines and that barbed wire fence that, I, I don't know, I, I think almost adding buffering would be unnecessary because there is such a distance. And there was one particular picture that I saw, um, not from this meeting but a, another meeting that it was from someone's backyard but it almost had looked like somebody had cut down trees in their own yard. Um, which I found, kind of thought was a little bit, well, if you want to keep, I mean, everyone has a right to do what they want in their own property, but if you already have buffering on your property, it doesn't really make sense to cut down trees and then complain that you can see the neighbor a little bit too much. But that was just one thing that I observed from that. So that's my opinion on it. Do we have some comments down here? Elaine? I think the, the buffering, I, I like the, um, Maureen's new proposal here al along the road, but I think the perimeter buffering otherwise is adequate in the existing forest. Are we going to talk about the front? Can okay, so we, uh, I think we have uh, yeah, I agree. something of a consensus that the, the buffering <coughs> in the front will be according to the new. Can I talk about that? Sure, if you will. So, the, what happened here is a member of the planning board asked me to do something because if you were not happy with what the applicant had brought forward for landscaping plan, your only option was to table this application. So this was an effort to illustrate badly, of course, um, an alternative plan so that if you were of a mind to move towards approval, you would have an alternative that you could refer to and a proposed condition of approval that goes with it. So uh, the applicant has seen this. I think they, re they said they were okay with it. Um, it's, it's slightly, the tr sherry trees have been removed. I spoke with the landscape architect. He said they would never survive in that location. Um, he suggested hemlocks rather than the eastern red cedar um, and that's why you have that proposal before you. Yep. Okay, so I think we've we've dealt with the fence, we've dealt with the buffering, we've Peter. dealt with concealment. I'm sorry, I say one thing on that issue. I did notice that in the new proposal, um, with the differences, the changes that you made to the the front portion of it, it seemed that if you're at the driveway and you're facing the gate, that you added more trees to the left, but then took away trees that you were going to put in on the right. Of that drive. I don't know. Well, the the intent here was um, not just buffering, but access management, because what's happened over the years is, you know, landscapers will go in there and mow and they mow and they mow, and so you have this big open, undefined gravel area. And my thought was that if you used evergreens to close in the gr the size of the driveway and keep it closed in, and you needed to do that on both sides. Right. I like that idea a lot, Maureen, mm -hmm. but I'm just pointing to this where on the right side of the driveway, right. there are no, I would suggest that there actually be trees planted on that side. Right. And, and yeah. Right. No, and I saw that, but I just want to make sure that the applicant's yeah. aware. Yeah, we're good. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think originally I I we, were, that we were thinking. It's been late. <laughs> yeah. You got your tree. Yeah, so we're, we're good with and, Maureen. And this also okay, eliminates right the, the, the split rail fencing. Okay, um, so I think if my notes are correct, we've discussed what appear to be items of concern to the public. Does anybody have anything else about this application they'd like to discuss? 
Okay. Well, oh, well, yeah. One thing that I want to point out to the public, too, if, if you didn't get a chance to look at the coverage map, I don't think it was put up there, but uh, I thought that was an important aspect that Verizon provided. This is the coverage right now with the non-green area being what's not covered. And this is what happens if with the coverage. And to myself, that's a huge concern. And I think that that's what is most important. I understand the angst that uh, people on Avon Road would have, and I respect that. Um, but at the same time, there's a whole other swath of cable that's not covered that will be covered. And I think that's a very important aspect of what the application is all about. OK. The, um, if we are going to go ahead and, and uh, have a motion and vote on this plan, it's going to be a little bit more laborious this time than normally. Uh, yes. If we're going to go through the motion here, um, as we have it proposed, I had a couple of questions on the specific findings. Well, we're going to go item by item. Okay. So if you'd like to raise them, we're going to vote on each item. Each, each separate. numbered item? Separately. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we'll when, when the later. moment comes, please uh, speak up. Um, the, I think the way to uh, keep everybody from uh, losing their voice is why don't we just rotate around? I'll take a, pa a pass with Jonathan's Joe, Elaine, and Carolyn, starting with finding number one, and we'll have a motion, second, and vote on each numbered item. Okay? So, Jonathan, would you like to start with the finding okay. of fact number one? Okay, just. Just so it's clear, so you want me to read number one and then I tap out and it goes to the next person, or no, just read until I'm well, actually, forced? Read number one. Over. Read number one. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, motion for the board to consider. The planning board typically attaches conditions to. You need all that? Yeah. Uh, Page six, number one at the bottom. Signing the, the fact Verizon Wireless is proposing to install wireless antennas on the existing water tower located at 11 Avon Road and to construct a 10 foot by 16 foot concrete pad at the base of the tower to support equipment cabinets and, a, and a, a generator, which requires review under section 19 9 site plan regulations and section 19 8 12 tower and antenna performance standards. Motion to approve. Seconded. So, so we're going to do the each one as a motion. We're not going to. You have to do each one. Each, each one. one is a motion. Yep. No. Okay. Motion. Second. Sure. In favor. Item one carries unanimously. Uh, Joe, number two. The location of the antennas and supporting equi equipment are located within the developed portion of the site. Motion. So moved. Joe, second. Jonathan, in favor? Opposed? It carries unanimously. Uh, Henry, number three. There is adequate capacity in the existing road system to accommodate a small amount of traffic generated by the project. Access to the site, internal vehicular circulation and parking accommodations are safe and convenient with access to management involvements. Motion by Henry, second. Elaine, in favor? Uh, can I propose a sure. Oh, sure. Specifically <laughs> reference the access management improvements um, as reviewed by the planning board tonight, because mm -hmm. I think that's what we're talking about, is it not? Mm -hmm. Do you want to add, as reviewed by the yes, indeed. planning board tonight? Yes. Agreed. Landscape plan option A dated 425-2016. Thank you. Uh, Do we need to re-vote? Uh, no, we hadn't voted yet. Second? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. uh, as amended? Second. Who seconded? In favor? <laughs> Opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, Elaine, number. Uh, Do you fill up your, your voice? Okay. Short one. A system of pedestrian ways is not appropriate for the proposed use and therefore is not provided. Seconded. Anyway, Henry, thank you. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? It carries unanimously. Number five, uh, Caroline. 
Adequate provision for stormwater has been provided by minimizing the increase in impervious surface and preserving the surrounding vegetation to retain stormwater on the site. Second. Second. Elaine, thank you. In favor? Opposed? It carries unanimously. Number six. Uh, back to you, John. Erosion control on the site is adequate by minimizing disturbed soils and complying with Maine's erosion and sedimentation control law when soils are disturbed. Second. Second. Thank you, Joe. In favor? <coughs> Opposed? It carries unanimously. Number seven, Joe. The proposed project does not require a water supply. Second. In favor? Mm -hmm. Opposed? It carries unanimously. Thank you. Heat, uh, Henry. The proposed project does not require sanitary waste disposal. Second. In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, number nine, Lane. The project has been provided with adequate electrical and telecommunications service. Second. In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Number 10, uh, Caroline. The project includes provisions to prevent discharge of materials harmful to human health or the environment. The owner of Portland Water District has an agreement with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection for remediation of lead on the site. Second. Second. Thank you, Joe. In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Number 11. And the project will not generate. Uh, generate. Yeah, generate. That, Solid, hazardous, or special waste. Second. Second. Thank you, Joe. In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Number 12. The project is not located in the Shoreland Performance Overlay District. Second. Second. Thank you, Henry. In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. 13. The applicant has demonstrated the financial and technical capabilities to complete the project. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, in favor? Opposed? It carries unanimously. 14. Um, okay, Lane. this is one of the ones I had a question. Okay. Am I correct that in fact there is no lighting at this site? Okay, then I think we have to change the finding, and I would suggest that the finding be additional lighting is not required for adequate safety at the site. Well, was but there it's not, not providing, but it's not providing any lighting. So that's my concern about the way that it's written. Oh, it's, a, it's absolutely light free. Yes. Uh, Perhaps if there's an emergency at night, no. They bring a flashlight. Oh, a flashlight. Oh, that's all we had. Yeah. <laughs> Again, sorry, Elaine. Your your language is <clears throat> then that it will will be provided. Additional safety. lighting is not required. Additional. Okay, additional. Just additional lighting is not required to provide adequate safety at the project. Second. Okay, in favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. You have that language, uh, Marie? I do. Okay. Uh, number 15, Carol Ann. Thank Sorry. you. The project does comply with the noise standard, the operation of a generator at night during power outage is no nope, you don't need that don't need that what you no. could just stop i can just stop right there with noise standard after the first sentence yes okay thank you sorry about that <laughs> second in favor opposed carries no. unanimously thank you uh, jonathan back to you for number 16. no outside storage of materials is proposed second, second. thank you in favor Opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, number 17. The use of shrouds and color coordinating cabling conceals the antennas. It is necessary to paint the water tower in order for color coordinated equipment to be concealed. Second. In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, Henry, number 18, please. Sorry. 18. Uh, mine, sorry. <laughs> the applicant as demonstrated by adding note dash five to plan C1, 
that it will obstruct co-location by other providers. Will not. Will not. Yeah, it will <laughs> not <laughs> obstruct. Uh, no. I think you are. No, correct. it says no five. Yeah, yeah. but it, but I think it's actually. It's no actually six. no six. Okay, so let's reread it. The applicant has not no, has yeah. demonstrated by adding no five plan note that it will six. not obstruct co-location by other providers. Note six. Right? Note no, six, six. That it will six. not obstruct co location by other providers. Not but not on that. Thing. Okay. Seconded. Second. In favor. Opposed. Carries unanimously. <laughs> <coughs> Number 19, uh, Elaine. The proposed antennas will blend into the surrounding environment through the use of color and. Um, Concealing architectural treatment. Thank you. Second. Isn't the word um, camouflage in the ordinance? Do you really want to argue with her? Mm -hmm. Do you really want to argue with her? Uh, Elaine, can I argue with you? Sure. The word camouflaging, I believe, is in the ordinance. There is sort of a strange uh, anomaly in the, the various provisions in the ordinance where the word conceal is certainly used, but I believe camouflaging is used back in section 19 something or other, isn't it? So yeah, I, this is from the, the tower and antenna performance standards. Right. So if you had a brand new tower, you would still apply these standards and it wouldn't necessarily be concealed. It would be camouflaged. But if you were in the district standards, then it's concealed. Um, so it's it somehow occurred to me that we, we have to have a finding with respect to the word camouflage. Could we add? Okay. Towers and tents shall be designed to blend into the environment through the use of color and camouflage. You, don't you already have a conceal? Yes. Number 17. You have a finding on concealing on number yeah, 17. Yeah, yeah, no. So yeah. this one, I think we, we want to say camouflage oh, okay. because the uh, uh, 1918-12 whatever, B. How about color and camouflaging architectural treatment that conceals the antennas? I'd like to use the word camouflaging because it's no, I'm, required. I'm leaving it in there. Oh, leaving in. Yeah, okay, leaving sorry. in camouflaging. camouflaging architectural treatment which and then means, adding at the end which, that conceals, or which, I'm not sure, uh, the antennas. I'd go with which. Which conceals the antennas, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. uh, I'm fine with that. Anybody else have? Oh, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, in favor? I'm not. I abstain from that one. No, you, okay. you can vote against it. No, I don't want to vote against it. I'm just abstaining. <laughs> okay. Here. That's your okay. Argument. The exist, existing vegetation and proposed plantings will provide a buffer and minimize visual impact. Second. <laughs> In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Oh, now we've got no lighting. Uh, Number 21, no, red, no lighting is proposed. We already said that. Redundant. Yeah. Two different sets of standards. Oh, two different I things. like my motion. <clears throat> Jonathan okay. just had a great I'll second motion. your motion. Did you rest your motion or not? We have a second. We vote in favor. Opposed. Carries unanimously. 22. The new antenna and ground supporting patent equipment are designed in conformance with structural standards. Seconded. Second. In favor. Opposed. Carries unanimously. The facility is surrounded by an existing fence, which is less than eight foot in height, but in existence prior to this application, that does not provide adequate security and should be increased to eight feet. That's in the conditions. We've got a condition. Okay. Okay. Uh, second on that? Second. In favor? Opposed, carries unanimously, uh, number 20-something or other, 24. 24. No advertising is proposed on the site. Second. In favor, opposed, carries unanimously, 25, Caroline. 
based on the license issued by the Federal Communications Commission, the equipment Will not. Will not interfere with his existing telecommunications within the service area. Did I answer that right? <laughs> second. Mm. A second uh, in favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, Jonathan, back to you for 26. The applicant has agreed to remove equipment after no more than 12 months of secession of use. Second. In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously, 26. The applicant shall be required to post a performance guarantee for the proposed improvements on the site. Second. In favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. The planning board conducted a site walk on the site located at 11 Avon Road on Saturday, February 27, 2016, beginning at 7.30 a.m. Second. In favor? <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Carried unanimously, 28. Okay. The application substantially complies with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19-8-12 Tower and Antenna Performance Standards. Second. Second. Favor? Carried unanimously. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going? You want me to keep going? Okay. Yeah. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Verizon Wireless is requesting site plan review to install wireless antennas in the existing water tower located at 11 Avon Road and to construct a 10 by 16 concrete pad at the base of the tower to support equipment cabinets and a generator to be approved subject to the following conditions that the plans be revised to label the height of the existing SCADA, SCADA antennas as eight feet high based on information provided by the Portland Water District, that the tower be painted and that all lead remediation be completed to the satisfaction of the DEP as described in their letter dated January 7, 2015 to Roger Parity at the Portland Water District prior to installation of any antennas or supporting equipment or cabling. That antennas and support equipment, including but not limited to any generator, not produce any noise that cumulatively exceeds 45 decibels between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., nor 55 decibels between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. of noise at the property line of the site. Four, that the antennas and cabling be concealed. Five, that the base of the tower, including any supporting equipment, structure, or cabinetry be enclosed within a minimum height eight-foot fence with locking gate, and that supporting equipment be further concealed with a wooden stockade fence of a height of eight feet or a lesser height if cabinetry is less than eight feet high. Carolyn, before you continue reading, should we add in the... Uh the uh, installation of the baffling uh, blanket inside the fence? If you want to, yes. May I ask that you... Uh, um, and a baffling blanket be included inside the generator enclosure. How's that? Great. Part of number five. <clears throat> six. Six, that a note be added to the plans that the installation shall be done in accordance with the current standards of the Electronics Industry Association structural standards for steel antenna towers and antenna supporting structures. Seven, that a performance guarantee and the amount to cover proposed improvements on the site and the cost of removal of equipment after 12 months succession of use. Eight, that there be no issuance of a building permit or alteration of the site until the plan, plans have been revised to, the satis to satisfy the above conditions and submitted to the town planner. Can I propose, I guess, a, a modification to item number four, that the antennas and cabling be concealed because that's what we're ask, being asked to decide. And I would say at the end that the antenna antennas and cabling be concealed in accordance with the plans presented. I could go for that. Yep. You know, do you want me to reread it or are we good? 
Yeah. I heard you propose an amendment, and I heard Carol Ann accept it. Okay. okay. Any other comments on the uh, language as read on the uh, the approval provision? And a motion as read by Carol and as amended by Elaine with Carol's agreement. Uh, call for a vote. Second. All in favor? Second. I have heard a second. I'm second. <laughs> second. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. I think we're I think we're good. Great. Okay. <clears throat> we uh, somewhere we have uh, Michael Freiland who's no, going to check. talk to us about his application. I believe. Oh, oh. Michael, you're on. If you wanted to go home, I'd be okay with me. <laughs> I'm going to grab the memory stick out of here. Hopefully. Let me. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Uh, let me hang on. Just uh, Michael. Just for the record, let me uh, <coughs> read this. And uh, Michael Friedlin is requesting site plan review of the change of use of the developed property located at 535 Shore Road. The building includes retail on the first floor and a multifamily unit on the second floor. The building predates site plan review. The applicant would like to operate an office on the first floor, which is a change of use triggering site plan review because no site plan has been approved for the site. In order to maximize his options, Mr. Friedland is asking for approval of a cat Category 3 village retail shop. Seed zoning ordinance VA District Section 10-6-5F. If he obtains this approval, he can operate a Category 3 or 2 use without further review as long as there are no exterior changes. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan review. Procedure will be as follows. The board will begin by having the applicant introduce the project. The board should then make a finding of completeness. If it's deemed incomplete, we'll, the board will identi identify the information needed to make it complete and there will be no substantive discussion the application. If it is deemed complete, then the subsequent review may begin. Uh, the board will also decide if a site walk or public hearing will be scheduled. At the close of the discussion, if it is deemed complete, the board has the option to approve, or approve conditions, deny, or fail. Mr. Friedland, thank you for your patience. Uh, it's probably a little later than you expected to be here tonight. Uh, yeah. But, um... He was warned. Yeah. Um, so, I, I don't, I don't have any slides or anything. I, I'm new to this. Um, so I purchased 535 Shore Road about a month ago, and the property is divided in two: half in Cape Elizabeth, half in South Portland, with the front triangle in South Portland and the rear triangle in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm not planning on making any changes to the site. It um, operated as a retail business. So as far back as it seems anyone can remember, um, South Portland always had it as a retail, and um, it was always retail for Cape. Um, there was a pharmacy, home health care, yarn shop, and most recently, Ann Veronica clothing jewelry store. Um, and uh, as I said, I'm not planning on making any changes to the site. I'm putting my office in there. And um, when I say office, it's, it's going to be very simple. I kind of purchased the building just for a garage bay. And I uh, wound up with a residence and an office space down low. So I, I don't have big plans for it, just um, low impact. And, um, and I tried to abide by all the um, limitations set by the code, um, which was not easy because the building's from around 1900 and the code is fairly recent. Um, so the tricky part was figuring out the parking. Because um, as I said, it's a contained site that's been the same way forever. 
with um, no complaints. So I did what I could, and it's all in here. And if, uh, I could elaborate or answer questions or, um, on any of it. Or should I? Or should I go through each item and? <laughs> Please. Uh, everybody's had a chance to read it. If, uh, yeah. Would board members like to uh, ask questions rather than have them go through page by page? I think that might be a good use of our time. I have a question. Yes, Joe. Um, I mean, this does seem like completely adequate to begin reviewing, but there's a question about the square footage. And um, I think Maureen, you said that the square footage is actually the footprint, the gross footprint, not, I think you took the interior square footage. Right, so what is the gross footprint? So footprint? I got 1728 for the main building and 564 for the uh, garage. Yeah, I think and the problem, Mr. Freeland, is, is the you've used in, apparently have used interior measurements. Oh no, I, I understand. What for ex, exterior walls? Right. Walls. I um. We don't have decent numbers for your square footage, which impacts the parking calculation. Right. So maybe so if we go off the seventeen hundred, is it um, one space for every three hundred thirty-three square Mr. foot? Mr. Friedland, well, I, think I don't think you want to back into this based on how much parking you can handle. You just need to know what the square footage of the outside walls of the building equals. Okay. With respect. But I think that I'd be willing to accept the square footage based on what's measuring this survey. Would you want that number added to the survey? Yeah. But I don't think that stands in the way of completeness. Are we basing it on this this sketch, which says 1517 at the bottom of the square there? No. And you've got a sketch on right. there, which you show the bottom. That sketch is from the through it, which I guess is the demarcation line between the two, between the town. Is that sketch my sketch, or is that from Sorry? the city? Is that from the city records, or is that my sketch? I don't know. I'm asking you. Sorry, it's the city records. It's the town of Cape Elizabeth. Okay. So, so, so the square footage would be 1517 divided by two, and plus the plus this. Oh, okay. That Didn't we get the survey? Yeah. yeah, there's a survey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we just so, need to add square footage to the survey. But, the, but, but on, your, on your drawing, right, is the top or the bottom of the drawing Cape Elizabeth? The, the bottom of the drawing, the street the side. The oh, no, I'm no. sorry. The street no. side, the street side oh. is... So you have a square which, which is 24 by, by 24, right? It's 24 by 24. This but is yeah, from the city records here. Yes, okay. So this is, this is Cape Elizabeth, this section here, right? Yes, exactly. So you have 24 by 24. Which is, that's the garage in the back. Okay, plus the 7 by 24. The, uh, and then this square right there, this square here divided by 2, plus or minus whatever that little we, bit is. We haven't put. been dividing it building in half we've been reviewing the whole site okay but no you said which which amount was in cape elizabeth rather than we had okay. i mean i guess the board can go that route well you, you're, you, we're you, looking you, at a building for usage we should look at the entire square footage of the building yeah. and uh, i think south portland is kind of kind of roll whatever way we roll if i remember what you said is that so that can I make a suggestion? It. Yeah, Joe's point. Given make it again, how late it is, can we just like go through this, the checklist, and yay or nay each item? What, which one are you looking at? The submission requirements. Page Sorry, three. I can't which, hear. which is page three of your memo. Yeah. If you have a memo, mm -hmm. page three is the site plan review submission checklist. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. 
Okay, so right title and interests we have, key map, et cetera. Um, lot line dimensions we have. I'm sorry, Joe, what is, would you help me out with your point? Well, my, no, my point is that we're just reviewing for completion. Right? For complete, that's right. Yeah, so, I mean, I think I'm just suggesting we go through this and make, as long as we all agree that everything is here, it's complete. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So if the square footage is 1728, and, and I have to say that part of that 1728 is a boiler room and a staircase to the second floor, which isn't at all part of the office it's space. It's the gross. Right. I understand that. I'm just adding that little note. And actually, it's the gross, including the garage, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's somebody, I guess. So I need to add the square footage of the garage as part of the office space? Yeah. The, the ordinance reads the gross square footage of the building. So the second floor as well? So it's 2,292 square feet. Well. You, you don't have to count the second floor because that's a residential unit. Right. He just said for the whole building. So I was just clarifying. Yeah, but he's talk, still trying to get to the whole footprint of the whole first floor. Right. I thought, from I, the exterior I thought you said the garage space wasn't included in it that. It is included. It is? Definition. But you told me it wasn't. The definition on page two of the memo for floor area of a structure, which is in the zoning ordinance, says the sum of the contiguous horizontal areas of the floors of a structure enclosed by exterior walls, including unfinished areas within the exterior walls and attached garages and excluding basement space, porches, and decks. And then the last sentence says, floor area shall be calculated by measurement of the outside dimensions of the exterior walls. So you, you, if we needed the square footage of the entire building, you would have to count the second floor. Right. But you are calculating the square footage of your office space. Right. And you're, now you're saying the office space includes the garage as well? I'm saying that everything inside the exterior walls has to be calculated. And we don't have to count the second floor because it's a residential unit. Right, I understand that. But when I met, but when unit, I met with you prior to the, when I met with you prior to this, you told me the garage space would not need to be included as part I, of the office you, space. This is the definition in the ordinance, and it says including garages. <sighs> um, so then, if we go by that, so if, defined. What was that? You take this sketch you've already defined. Because that's what Maureen asked for, the active dimensions of the building. And you've already defined it. It's just that you've got to calculate 576, 168, 1517, and 296, and that's it. I don't have uh, Henry, what mind you, to add that Henry, up. what are you reading from? What? The assessing part. It's reading okay. from the uh, assessment page. The, the yeah, assessing not map is not what we're, uh, we're not using that. You have to use the survey. It's, a, it's <laughs> this, this guy right here. So, Maureen, if, correct me if I'm wrong, we need an accurate square footage to calculate the parking requirements from which Mike is requesting some relief. And, and I also believe you need an accurate square footage in order to grant an approval. Because typically when you grant yeah. approvals for types of uses, other than residential, you quote a specific square footage. So are you saying you so, want the surveyor to represent what it is? I think we need a measurement that goes from the exterior walls. Okay. And one way to, I mean, this is the problem. One way to do it would be to use a survey that the applicant has submitted. Another way to do it would be to use the assessing card. But I don't think calculating the interior walls, which was done on one page of the applicant's application, meets the definition. No. Well, this, this is what we're working with now, and it doesn't meet the definition. Which one Correct. are we looking at now? Given yeah, the hour, would it make sense to find this is not complete in 
come back to the next meeting with the measurements and the, the detail of your request on parking using the correct measurements? Sure. Will that be a problem? It won't be a problem. I just want to make sure that it, I, I won't be doing work for no reason because then I'm going to be at 12 parking spaces required. And, and then I have a lot of provisions that would have to be taken into account in order to accommodate those spaces. So if I come back with the proper measurements and I say, all right, I need 12 spaces, but I'd like the board to discount it by 30%, then allow for stack parking, and then allow for two spaces on the street in South Portland. Like, if the board's going to say no, 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 it's well, sort it, of... Yeah, no, you're right. But to get there, we've got to start... From the, you know, square one has right. to be accurate dimensions because you're asking for stacking, you're asking for the reduction, and it's a little bit weird, but I think it makes sense. You're asking no, no, I, I, for the South Portland on-street parking requirements, among other reasons, because the property fronts in South right. Portland. Yeah, I, I could probably say right now that I'd need 12 spaces based on the seven, based on about the 2,300. So it would be around 17 plus 500, so about 12 spaces would be required about. Well, whatever you can't make up for on site is going to have to be on, on street. Right, well, I guess what I was saying is that Based on my proposed considerations, there's a couple of things that the board could consider to reduce those number of parking spaces. Because I've searched off-site, and there is no off-site parking. Work, yeah. I've checked everywhere. Substantive yeah, that, would, that is substantive. Um, tell you what, let me suggest to the board that we find that it's not complete. Ask Mr. Friedland to come back for the next meeting with the data and work in the meantime with Maureen to formulate a scheme, if you will, or a request to handle the parking requirement, whatever it might be. All right, yeah, I've been working on that. Um, I'll, I'll come back with the new dimensions and the new number of parking spaces needed. May I ask one question? And I, this is for Maureen. I, I missed the workshop, and maybe this was discussed at that time. Um, but how did this place function beforehand? It is a I, I, building, I, yeah, it's a building that predates any development review. So it has no site plan review. It was built before we regulated this type of thing. Okay. So because he's a new owner, he's now. It's not the, he's, he's changing the use. New use. Uh, and under the ordinance, if you want to change the use, you trigger site plan review, which drags him into all of this. He's changing the use from a commercial. From, re from retail to office. Gotcha. All right. And I have one other question. If, if it comes to light that I need 12 parking spaces and I can only provide four, can I just not use the building? Is there, like, I, I don't know what happens. Is there just an impasse where that this building can't be functional? Maureen, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sure. So you're saying that we have to do this because the applicant wants to change the use. Yes. But the approval that the applicant is requesting is not for a change of use. He's requesting a pr an approval for the historic use. He isn't. He's, he's actually going from a grand, and I know it seems strange, but he's, he's going from a grandfathered retail use to a site plan approved Category 3 village retail, which allows him both to operate village retail type uses and Category 2 type uses. Which requires more parking, retail or It, it or goes office. back and forth. It, I mean, one parking is based on square footage. There's two different square footage requirements, and then they also talk about employees. So I guess I'm a little troubled to kind of... Um, permanently give our stamp of approval to a property that has four parking places yep. where our standards would require 12. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if there isn't some other way to accomplish. <laughs> Not that the purpose. code enforcement officer and I have been able to figure out. Well, can I ask a gentleman a question? It, 
are you going to be retail there or you, no is no. it just a retail op well i was going to say is it just going to be a retail space that just never never has customers the qu the, the concern is that the applicant is working with both town of cape elizabeth and city of south portland regulations and the irony is that in Cape Elizabeth, he is closer to a conforming use than he is in South Portland. In South Portland, the property is in a residential zone. And right now, the grandfathered non-conforming use is retail. And he is seeking approval to go to office. I understand. If things don't work out, he has two years under the city of South Portland rules to go back to retail. And he's trying to leave his options open. Okay. I, the only reason I, I wondered was, you know, if, if you had a retail store that doesn't have any customers, I didn't see a change. Of right. But the par I think the parking requirements for office are fairly similar to retail regardless. I think I, instead of needing 12 spaces, maybe I need 11. Yeah, he's, he still has it's, woefully It's short. still. Woefully I understand, but it doesn't have to change anything. If he didn't change use by just leaving it as it was, oh, you wouldn't because change Because the, the last use of the store was Ann Veronica, which was retail. It was the, the current hmm. the current use that's it's recognized under the town of Cape Elizabeth is retail. I understand. And he wants to change it to anything else than retail. I understand. Trigger site plan. I, I understand that. That's, <laughs> that's why. Really I, I have a suggestion. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've already we pretty much determined it's going to be deemed incomplete. Would it be appropriate for him to come back for another workshop to discuss some of this stuff? At a yes. workshop. Yes, absolutely. Rather than here. Yeah, that, that would be, I think that would be useful. I, I, my own theory is South Portland lets you use on street parking to assess and the proper. <laughs> okay, that. <laughs> let's I talk about that at the workshop. If, if we've determined this is incomplete, let's move on. Let's, could I have let's a motion? Have a conversation. Could I have a motion to determine it incomplete and um, table to. Nope, just deem it incomplete. Deem okay. Okay. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Michael Friedland for site plan review of the change of use of 2,389 square feet to village retail of a developed property located at 535 Shore Road be deemed incomplete. Second. In favor? Opposed? No, Maureen, don't we need a. a no. Uh, we don't. No. Once you deem it incomplete, you're he, done. Okay. Yeah. He has to come back and then, then he can call me tomorrow and we can talk about that. We week. haven't started okay. the clock. Yet. May I make a motion? We adjourn. Uh. Second. <laughs> Let's go home.